Are there any constituency statements from honourable members? I call the member for Burt. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The economic effects of COVID-19 have hit hard in Perth's southeastern suburbs, which make up the electorate of Burt that I represent. Whilst the good work of the McGowan government has seen less than 40 coronavirus cases across my community, I will never forget seeing the queues from the Armidale Centrelink that first Monday after everything shut down, extending all the way down the hill to the train station. I visited the Centrelinks in Gosnells and Armidale the next morning. Both still had queues of frustrated and anxious newly unemployed. Across our community, around 4,000 people will lose work by the end of June and not receive JobKeeper including nearly 2,000 across the retail, hospitality and education sectors. But today I also want to say thank you to the people of Burt. Never has it been more important for a community to pull together while staying apart. Thank you for your patience, your kindness and your resilience. Thank you to those that have gone out of your way to look after someone in need in our community. To the staff at Armidale Kelmscott Memorial Hospital, one of WA's main COVID testing clinics, I say thank you. To the staff at the Centrelinks in Armidale, Cannington and Gosnells, who worked through the nights, weekends and public holidays to get people's payments through faster, thank you. To our local councils, who are providing local community support and economic stimulus plans, whilst trying to keep as many of their own staff on board when they can't get access to JobKeeper, thank you. To the volunteers who have spent countless hours on the phone to people who are isolated, just making sure they're doing okay, thank you. To the charities that have been making sure that everyone has food to eat, clothes to wear and a roof over their head, thank you. To our RSLs who weren't able to hold Anzac Day ceremonies as they usually would, thank you for the dig dignity you still inspired on the day as we stood alone together on our driveways and for the support you always give our veterans. To the grocery workers who have been working hard around the clock stacking shelves, controlling crowds and selling essentials, thank you. To the teachers and childcare workers who day after day put yourselves out to look after and teach the children of frontline and other essential workers, potentially risking your own wellbeing, thank you. To our women's refugees who have seen a significant rise in calls for help and the aged care and disability workers confronting much harder conditions, thank you. To our local examiner newspaper, which is focused on the best of what this crisis has brought out in our community, not the worst, thank you. To the Burke Community Cabinet, three levels of government as well as business, of different politics but working for what is best for our community, thank you. There's a long road ahead for the community of Burt and our nation. I think we're all acutely aware of that, but together we've proven we can get through this. Thank you. And thank you, Member for Burt. I now call Member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In a quiet suburb of Launceston sits Australia's oldest working textile mill. Established in 1874, Waverley Woolen Mills to this day still produces the highest quality wool products that are guaranteed to last, beautifully created and ethically produced. Today, the suburb of Waverley is home to some 1,500 residents, but has just one local shop. The needs of some in the community were highlighted when the coronavirus pandemic first hit the state in late March. For some in this community, and indeed across northern Tasmania, the shortages of basic food items such as bread and rice were a very real reality. In difficult times, though, there are always some rays of sunshine to be found, such as caring community members like Danielle Watkins. With a few spare veggies in her garden and some spare pantry items, Danielle put together a few shelves outside her front fence creating what has become the Waverley Community Co-op. What started as a way of helping her neighbours has filled a much needed gap for community members seeking essentials. The mantra of the co-op is take what you need, share what you can, and it's become quite popular in an area where access to the supermarket under coronavirus restrictions has been difficult, especially for those without a vehicle, making it quite difficult for families with young children to get everyone on a bus to make a trip to buy essentials. The local store provides a great service, but it doesn't provide fresh food options and nor should it be expected to. There's increasingly a gap between what the community needs and deserves and what it has. The community co-op is wonderful and has the opportunity to grow, but to do so it will need to operate out of a full bricks and mortar building with essential infrastructure in place. And even in a suburb of 1,500 people, such a building does not currently exist. 
Additionally, there is a need for community infrastructure for the area, facilities where, in a post-COVID environment, children can play, families can congregate for barbecues, be outside together and teenagers have access to amenities in their own neighbourhood. Governments play an essential role in assisting communities like Waverley, and I believe it will take a coordinated effort between all three levels of government, local, state and federal. I met with the City of Launceston back in February to advocate for the needs of this community and to discuss next steps. After I became aware of the co-op and the need for a space to keep the service going and to meet the needs of the community, I also wrote to the council to raise that issue and see what can be done. I'll be working with the council over the coming months to progress these infrastructure needs and will also be talking to my state and federal colleagues to discuss the possibilities that can be explored to enhance this community. <coughs> Waverley is a wonderfully warm, vibrant and connected community full of great young people, hard working families and retirees who have lived in this neighbourhood for decades. There's no reason why they can't enjoy the same benefits of those in other suburbs around them, and I'll continue to advocate for this to happen. Thank you, and I call the member for Whitlam. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Well, various forecasts are estimating that unemployment is set to exceed 10% of the workforce by June this year, and even the Reserve Bank of Australia estimates that it will remain persistently high over the next few years. For the communities that I represent, uh, this means somewhere in the order of 12,500 people uh, potentially losing their jobs. We welcome the fact that the government has picked up Labor's suggestion of a wage subsidy program, although we note that it is set to conclude by September, October this year. Economic recovery is likely to be slow, uh, and it won't happen automatically. We need assistance from the Commonwealth Government and the Commonwealth working hand in hand with the state governments, local governments and local businesses to get the economy and employment moving again. I have asked local governments and development authorities in my region to bring forward proposals which will assist in this task. Now, Normally when we do this, the big projects, the projects that we've been talking about in our region for some time Order. are proposed. Uh, a division has been called in the House and therefore proceedings of the Federation Chamber are suspended to allow honourable members to attend to the House. The House will resume when this division and any subsequent divisions are concluded. The member for Whitlam. As I was saying, Deputy Speaker, um, when we normally go to bodies and ask for ideas for stimulus programs, the big projects come forward. And I encourage them to still think about the big projects. Morton Dombarden, the Picton Road, uh, off-ramps uh, on the highway. These are all important projects. But I'd also like us to think of things that aren't as lumpy and that are going to be able to be brought forward quickly to give that employment stimulus where it's needed. I'd like to propose two areas that warrant attention. The first is social housing. Before the crisis, we have an issue with homelessness. We have an issue with affordable housing. Let's use this as an opportunity to inject investment into social housing opportunities, creating stimulus to the building and construction sector, uh, but also providing a roof over the heads for people in need. The second area that I'd like to propose is a widespread pest eradication project. In the Illawarra, and particularly along the uh, escarpment, for decades we have had a big problem with feral deer uh, enroaching on urban areas, creating uh, traffic hazards, uh, creating problem with the uh, rolling stock on the trains. Let's not let a crisis go to waste. I'd like to see some proposals coming forward which enabled us to upscale our pest eradication program and focus on something which has been a big problem throughout the National Park, throughout the Illawarra and Southern Highlands for decades. So I'd encourage our local authorities, local, state, uh, to be working on a program that we could propose to the federal government. I'll be very happy to advocate for it in this place. Let's ensure that we can do something about a long-standing problem during this crisis. Order, and I call the member for Dawson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak about the plight of uh, tourism operators, tourism workers, and the entire Whit Sundays. Uh, we um, came to the rescue somewhat for some of the businesses there with uh, 
a JobKeeper program for some of the workers as well. And uh, yesterday uh, it was announced and today we are uh, putting into the parliament the fee relief for reef tourism operators, uh, they, their reef tax, the uh, Great Barrier Reef Marine uh, Park Environmental Management charge uh, for uh, right up until February uh, is being waived. Uh, that will be money back in the pockets of tourism operators. And I note the Whit Sunday Charter Boat Industry Association has uh, written to uh, myself and Minister Lay, uh, uh, the Minister for the Environment, I should say, the Deputy Prime Minister and others, uh, to say that personally on behalf of the Whit Sunday Charter Boat Industry Association, she's offering her sincere and heartfelt thanks for the support that the government has shown to the industry in what will be long remembered as one of its darkest times. And indeed, it is a dark time in uh, the Whit Sunday's tourism industry. The numbers that I've received um, from Tourism with Sundays, their collated, collated industry impacts due to the pandemic crisis are just terrible to read. The number of businesses directly impacted by the events, uh, not, not, uh, uh, this is not a surprise, 100%, all of them. Um, number of businesses that have suspended operations, 85. This is the kicker, jobs lost. 2,760 in a very small community of the Whitsundays. Number of room nights cancelled, almost 30,000. Tour and activities cancelled, almost 24,000. At a total estimated value of almost $130 million, ripped out of a very, very small economy that is uh, uh, where tourism accounts for one in three jobs and 40% of the $6.3 billion uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the income that goes into the Great Barrier Reef industry. It is very, very, very alarming. Things need to happen now. I believe there needs to be increased assistance for the tourism sector, particularly in infrastructure. There needs to be an ongoing uh, range of support in JobKeeper, I believe, for the tourism sector beyond the end of uh, the current rollout of JobKeeper. We also need the state government to subsidise uh, marine berthing costs. Uh, we need action taken against some of these travel, online travel agencies that have ripped off both the consumer and the businesses and tourism businesses, owing them a lot, a lot, a lot of money for months of tours that have been taken. These are things that need to happen now as we try to get out of this pandemic crisis. Order. I call the member for Chifley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Now, to ensure the safety of the nation, uh, the Morrison government acted correctly on the advice of the chief medical officer to shut our borders. It was done to protect us from the spread of coronavirus, and it was absolutely the right thing to do. But with actions come consequence. And if you're an aviation or tourism worker, you calculate the impact of no flights in, no flights out in a heartbeat. Now, the government moved quickly to stop flights, but they seem to have spared no time or care for the workers affected. Employees at Virgin certainly understand that. And so do employees at Donata, the firm that supplies catering and other services to airlines. I learned about this firsthand when contacted by Adam from Lethbridge Park in the Chifley Electric. He's a Donata employee, worked with them for over a decade, and he understandably expected the government would be there for him when he needed them most. He and his workmates thought they'd get access to JobKeeper. They thought this because their company believed, based on government advice, they would be included in JobKeeper. And right at the moment they stepped up for that support, the door was shut in their face. And why? Because Donata is owned by another government. And our government didn't like that. And they didn't think one minute about blokes like Adam. Sure, he works for a company that's owned by another government. But he's an Australian worker performing work on Australian soil, paying taxes here and helping the economy. He and his workmates do their bit for us, and he would rightly expect his government would be there for him in a tough spell. Instead, after working for Donata for 11 years, Adam's been stood down and told to go find work when there's little work around. Um, and he faces the prospect of losing his livelihood. Now, it's important to note, the JobKeeper is not held by the companies, it's supposed to be passed through to the employees. So it's not like we're handing this cash over to another government. It's helping workers here on Australian soil. Now, through this crisis, Labor has attempted to be constructive and responsible, but being constructive does not mean being mute. And I will not shut up when average workers 
uh, Australian workers like Adam and his workmates are being let down. These workers should get the respect and dignity they deserve by extending JobKeeper payments to them. And my message to the government is simple. You did the right thing on the borders, but the wrong thing by these workers. But the good news is you can fix this today, and you should. And I'd call on the Treasurer to do just that. Fix it today with the stroke of a pen and ensure Donata workers and their families get looked after. Order. And I call the member for Moncrief. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge those who are currently suffering from the effects of COVID-19 on the Central Gold Coast. In the first week of this crisis, I established the Moncrief Community Cabinet to work together with community leaders to ensure that trusted sources of information could be shared directly with our people in the heart of the Gold Coast. Seeing our community come together during this pandemic is indeed a silver lining. I was pleased that together with the Gold Coast Community Fund, we delivered funding for Haverfeed, the Lynn Richardson Community Centre and the Gold Coast Convention and Exhibition Centre to ensure they could provide meals to those who need extra support at this time. In Surface Paradise, St John's Crisis Centre continues its wonderful work creating emergency meal packs and I'm pleased that further funding was provided by the Morrison government's community support package. As the Prime Minister has said, we are fighting two battles, one on the health front and one with our economy. I'd like to thank those on the coast who are on the front line, our healthcare workers, supermarket workers and those in essential jobs such as construction and real estate who have kept us moving. Of course, a big thank you to you, all those Gold Coasters who have abided by social distancing rules. It's not easy, but it's because of the sacrifices that you have made that we can now look forward uh, towards the recovery sooner than what we thought. Tourism, education, events and hospitality are all key pillars in our city and like the rest of Australia, the blow to the Gold Coast economy has been devastating. This is why I established the City Heart Task Force to engage with key industry sectors to build inner city strategies as we foster the economic road to recovery. It gives me the opportunity to hear updates directly from small business, tourism, hospitality, education and real estate to ensure I can continue the fight for the good people of Moncrief here in this place. I've developed a business help finder and a resource hub on my website to assist local business with all the important questions they have about the many government support programs available. It's been inspiring to see so many small businesses adapt in these tough times and I encourage businesses in Moncrief to visit my website to find useful tools to help them reopen in the days ahead. I also launched the Love Your Local campaign on my social media channels, Deputy Speaker. It's critical in the months ahead that we shop local to save jobs and businesses. I commend the government's JobKeeper program. It's allowed, the, it's allowed the engine room of the Gold Coast to keep operating, uh, albeit in a lower gear. Additionally, I was very pleased that the Morrison government delivered a funding lifeline to our theme parks to assist with operational costs for wildlife care. It's $1,000 a week to feed just one of the many dolphins at SeaWorld. So this will assist them greatly with their animals. There's also now a permanent boarding station to welcome international super yachts at Southport Yacht Club as soon as our borders are open and the new berth is built. This is a huge vote of confidence in our city. I was pleased to be able to deliver these boosts for the tourism industry moving into the future, Mr Deputy Speaker. We still don't have a clear picture of what the post-COVID-19 Gold Coast will look like, but I'm here for one purpose, and that's to keep fighting for the people of the Central Gold Coast. There's still a long way to go before we recover from this crisis, but together we will get through it and we will rebuild the heart of our beautiful city. Well, thank you, Member for Moncrief. We'll call the Member for Ballarat. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I too want to echo the words of the Member for Chifley, and I think indeed possibly the Member for Hume, uh, Hughes, uh, when he's uh, calling on the government to fix the issue for the Donata workers of access to JobKeeper. Uh, this is urgent and it is incredibly important. These workers have not chosen the uh, structure who owns their company. In fact, many of them started when it was owned by Qantas. Uh, have worked there for a long period of time and it's, it's absolutely incumbent on the government to fix this problem immediately. But in my own community, uh, our whole community as a result of COVID-19, as like so many others, has faced struggles unparalleled in any of our lifetimes. We've all had to change the way we work, the way we socialise, the way that we live our lives. Through it all, the people in my community of Ballarat have filled me with nothing but pride. Throughout this crisis, I've made it a habit to set aside some time to make some calls to uh, older uh, people within my electorate just to check on how they're going. I've heard countless stories from elderly and vulnerable members of our community about the assistance that they've received and what it has meant to them. I've heard of the neighbours who've stopped by the front gate for a chat, who do the shopping, who offer a kind word, or just let them know that they're here to help. 
if they're needed. This kindness has been offered by our community has made a real difference to the lives of so many. While our community as a whole has done so much, there are of course those who have gone a step above, and I, today I want to thank them very much. First, I want to thank our frontline healthcare staff, doctors, nurses, ambos, pharmacists, aged care workers and all other practitioners. You've done an amazing job under incredible difficulty. You have quite literally put your own lives at risk for our community and you continue to do so day in and day out. Of course, there are the hidden heroes in our hospitals as well. The cooks, the cleaners, the admin staff, everyone who keeps our hospitals and our clinics turning over. Thank you too for your work. Thank you again, particularly to the aged care workers. It's been extraordinarily difficult for older residents and their families, and your outstanding work have made it much easier on all of us. I want to thank those workers who've kept our society functioning over the past few months. The truck drivers, the supermarket workers, the cleaners, bus drivers, police officers, delivery drivers, those working in our takeaway shops and every other essential worker. Without you, we could not have got to where we have. Finally and personally, I want to send a big thank you to our teachers. Uh, like many here in this place and across the community, uh, I have seen firsthand how much work that you do as we supervise our children learning at home. The effort and absolute dedication you've shown in educating our children across our community, including my own, has been a delight to observe. Of course, this battle isn't over. We still have long months to go before we can return to normal, but I have been touched and very encouraged by the wonderful response of our community to the challenges we have all faced. And I thank the member for Ballarat and call the member for Cowper. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, 12 months ago this Monday, the electorate of Cowper gave me the honour of representing them in this place, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for putting their trust in me to best represent their interest. But more importantly, Deputy Speaker, I would like to recognise their determination and resilience over the past 12 months. I came into this place at the on the tail end of one of the worst droughts in decades. Our farmers' dams and water tanks were empty, their stock sold at devastating prices, they had no crops and no money. Our towns are on level five restrictions and the Maclay River had stopped flowing for the first time in living memory. So what did the people of Cowper do? They dug deep for our farmers. They bought bales of hay, they bought water, they donated, they banded together, they abided by the strict conditions for a common cause. And then came the fires. Months and months of fires, some were catastrophic, taking lives, livelihoods, houses, properties, swathes of land, killing livestock, native animals, flora and fauna. Week after week of smoke haze so bad that it closed schools, businesses and decimated our tourism industry. So what did the people of Cowper do? They fought as RFS officers, the SES, or simply volunteered, donated, cooked or provided a shoulder to cry on. Ironically, then it rained and it rained and it rained. And God's sense of humour was not lost on us, but the rain washed away precious topsoil and riverbanks and left, left barren by the fires. Tens of thousands of fish were killed in the Maclay River and it significant, significantly damaged the oyster industry. But in true Aussie fashion, we got on with it. And now this, COVID-19, and my electorate is not alone. Businesses have closed, many thousands lost jobs, Export industry stopped in its tracks, lives put on hold and in some cases lives lost. But as always, this challenge was met by my constituents and yours. Just like the drought, just like the fires, the floods, the Australian people have shown their true character and true Australian spirit. And for that, I say thank you. To the people of Cowper, I will continue to do my best to represent you to represent your interests and to make the electorate of Cowper a better place. Thank you. I thank the member for Cowper and call the member for Isaacs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to pay tribute <coughs> to a great Labor member, a great Australian and a great friend, <coughs> Mike Kelly, the retiring member for Eden Monero. 
As members here know, just before we returned to this session of Parliament, Mike announced that he was retiring from politics as a result of health problems sustained during his service to our nation. I, like so many of my colleagues, am very sad to see Mike leave. I'll miss his wise advice, informed by the incredible experience he brought to this place following his 20 years of service in our Defence Forces. That included service in Timor-Leste, Somalia, the Balkans and Iraq, where Mike's commitment and ability led to promotion after promotion until he retired as a colonel and took up a different kind of fight here in this place. I think it says a great deal about Mike's character that having served our nation for two decades in the military, Mike then volunteered to again serve his community and his nation here in the national parliament and that he did it in the most difficult way possible by standing for a marginal coalition held seat. It's a testament to Mike's standing in his community that he did this not once but twice and the second time became the first member in almost 50 years to hold Eden Monero in opposition. Mike's hard-won experience in the Army, his intelligence and his deep humanity have been clearly evident throughout his parliamentary career, most notably in relation to matters of national security. I'm pleased that all sides of politics have recognised his authority in this sphere and shown due respect for Mike's views particularly in the vital work of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, in which Mike and I have long served together. When Labor was last in government, Mike distinguished himself in five Parliamentary Secretary portfolios and as Minister for Defence Materiel. Mike's unparalleled experience and first-hand understanding of how policies work in the real world, including the, the impact that they have on real people, added immeasurably to policy development and implementation in both the Labor Party and in this parliament. Our country is better and more secure for having had the benefit of Mike's many contributions as a member of this parliament. I'm going to miss Mike's wisdom, his good humour and his friendship in this place. On behalf of the Australian Labor Party and of all members of this parliament, I wish Mike and his wonderful wife, Shelley, and all his family the best for the future. I thank the member for Isaacs and call the member for Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like to share with the House some of the outstanding work done by an environmental organisation in Bonner, Ocean Crusaders, who have removed more than 46 tonnes of marine debris this year alone. I was very pleased to deliver a $20,000 grant to help Ocean Crusaders run programs to clean up our local waterways. Just last week, they held a Balimba Creek clean-up event and removed nearly three tonnes of rubbish. What an outstanding effort. Earlier this year, Assistant Minister Trevor Evans and I joined Ocean Crusaders for Clean Up Australia Day. We worked alongside dozens of volunteers, boaties and kayakers to remove a further 2.5 tonnes of rubbish from our waterways that otherwise would have ended up in our beautiful Moreton Bay. Another clean-up event along Breakfast Creek in, in last, uh, late April resulted in a further 800 kilograms of debris removed from the back of mangroves. It's muddy, wet and often exhausting work, but the amazing team at Ocean Crusaders, led by Ian Thompson and flanked by dozens of volunteers, is making a huge difference to our waterways. From old bicycles, tyres, plastic bottles, discarded fishing lines and more, the team at Ocean Crusaders have seen it all. Without the selfless efforts of this environmental organisation, more than 46 tonnes of rubbish would have ended up in Moreton Bay, home to an abundance of fish, dolphins, turtles, dugongs and occasionally whales. It's heartbreaking to discover a dead turtle and find out it was rubbish and plastic that killed it. In my electorate of Bonner, we are so proud of our pristine Moreton Bay loved by boaties and fishermen, and as a community, we need to do everything that we can to protect our marine life and waterways. Yeah, yeah. Australians love the great outdoors. We love the water, and it's our job to protect it. I was so proud to deliver funding through the Communities Environment Program to help the team at Ocean Crusaders continue the great work that they do. Large-scale waterway cleaning is a tough job, and I commend the team for their passion and commitment to healthy waterways. Belimba Creek, Moreton Bay and my Bonner electorate are all the better for it.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Bonner. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 193, the time for members' constituency statements has expired, and I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, Australia's COVID-19 health response, ministerial statement, motion to take note. The question is that the document be noted, and I call the member for Petrie. Well, thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's great to rise today and speak about Australia's health response to COVID-19. Of course, what we've seen over the last few months, not just here in Australia, but around the world, has been unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes, and governments right around the world have tried to deal with this health crisis, this pandemic, uh, for the interests of their citizens and to make sure that they're kept healthy. I think uh, Australia has done extremely well. We've obviously had a low uh, death rate, a low infection rate and high testing rates. And that's great. But I know that the government wants to ensure that we maintain that great health record and ensure that the economy opens up again. Uh, I spoke to some of my constituents recently about how they're feeling on these issues. I've been working hard in my office talking to people on the phone. And I've had a bit of feedback from uh, local people online as well. Jules Lawrence said, I think our Prime Minister is doing an amazing job. Well, Jules, thank you for that. There was quite a few people that liked that comment. It's pretty clear that uh, he has led by example and Australians do appreciate it and I've passed that on to him. Kelly Logan, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to answer. Kelly says, I think the long-term economic downturn caused by the virus will be much deadlier than the virus itself, Kelly says. Stress, suicide, we will not learn the true effect for a few years yet. And although not entirely our government's fault, they were following orders uh, or recommendations from the top. Now, Kelly, you're absolutely right. Mental health is a big issue. And some of the biggest contributing factors to mental health uh, are often that if people lose their job, employment outcomes, if they lose their job or lose their business, that can have a huge impact on people's mental health. And I note that the Prime Minister and our Health Minister yesterday, Greg, Greg Hunt, made a statement, and there's an article here written by Simon Benson that says, the PM puts mental health at the top of the medical agenda. And the article says that Scott Morrison will appoint the country's first Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Mental Health to steer a new pandemic plan for a feared second wave of coronavirus crisis. The Australian can reveal the role to be discussed by National Cabinet on Friday. We'll sit alongside the Chief Medical Officer, Brendan Murphy, who has been leading the country's response to the pandemic and has recommended mental health be elevated to a tier one issue. So Kelly, I want you to know that the Australian government recognises that mental health is a big issue. There's been lots of mental health support, not just on this announcement that was announced this week and will be discussed at National Cabinet on Friday, but uh, the Morrison government has announced some $1.1 billion to support more mental health, Medicare and domestic violence services. More help will be given to millions of Australians battling the devastating impacts of coronavirus with a $1.1 billion package which boosts mental health services, Kelly, domestic violence support, Medicare assistance for people at home and emergency food relief. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of different, uh, the 1800 Respect number, the National Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Counselling Service, which already supports around 160,000 calls a year. There's Men's Line Australia, a, a line specifically for men that want to discuss how they're feeling. There's traffic people's programs, uh, support, support for women and children. In my own role as Assistant Minister in Social Services, we're building some $60 million worth of new uh, housing for safe places to support 6,500 women and children a year. So there is a lot happening around mental health. The other thing that really affects people's mental health, of course, is housing. If you lose your home, well, <laughs> you know, it, often that can have a big impact on, on people's mental health. And safe and secure housing has been a key defence in the fight against coronavirus. Obviously, the Morrison government, in partnership with states and territory governments, is making sure Australians struggling to put a roof over their head continue to get the support they need. And 
more than 1.3 billion of housing loans through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation is delivering more than 1,500 new social and affordable dwellings right now and refinancing a further 5,000 existing dwellings. Housing, of course, is a prime responsibility of state and territory governments, and I've been working closely with state housing ministers on what they're doing and how they're investing more than $1.6 that the federal government gives them each year through the uh, NAHA agreement. And we also invest another $4.5 billion a year to community housing organisations and the private sector with Commonwealth rent assistance, just to name a few things, what we're doing there as well. Bradley Husband, a constituent, said, I get giving extra money who were forced onto unemployment because of the government shutdown, but I'm disappointed that we are throwing money at the long-term unemployed. Their circumstances haven't changed, so they did not need to be given extra money. I pay my taxes because at the end of the day, the taxpayers who go to work every day are the ones paying it back and so forth. Well, Bradley, I hear what you're saying, but not everyone that has found themselves unemployed have done so through their own choosing. Lots of people are actively looking for work. We've seen through the coronavirus crisis uh, literally tens of thousands of new people on job seeker. I was speaking to someone this morning online who uh, has worked with Virgin or a company affiliated with Virgin who's now found herself on job seeker. She just lives down the road from me. She's a hard working person. And many people I've come across in my own role and in the electorate are actively looking for work. But that's why I run in my electorate those job seeker boot camps to, re to connect people who are actively looking for work with employers that hire people and give them the skills and knowledge when they're looking for work on what to do. So please be assured that people before this coronavirus impact were in place, people on New Start, we had some of the lowest numbers in the country ever. So our unemployment rate before coming in was in the very low fives, about 5.1 per cent nationally. So uh, not everyone that finds themselves on New Start are not actively looking for work, I can assure you of that. Michelle Scowan says, Australian ownership and manufacturing. Government needs to lead by example and purchase manufacture in Australia rather than buying cheaper overseas. The reason it's cheaper overseas is because their minimum wage is lower. With the advantages of workers' rights here in Australia come the disadvantages of higher costs. We all need to be buying Australian and the government needs to prioritise this and incentivise and support local manufacturing. Now, this is coming through very clearly to me from people in my constituencies, in my electorate of Petrie, that they want to see more local manufacturing. They want to see Australians supporting Australian manufacturing. Now, I have a bit of manufacturing in our electorate. Uh, the Minister for Science yesterday, Karen Andrews, uh, spoke in the Parliament about Packer Leather, who employs more than 100 people in my electorate. I've got other people like East Coast Bull Bars in Contact that manufacture bull bars. And I've spoken before about the Evolve Group that are reshoring products uh, from China back here. And manufacturing can be done. Obviously, we need to make sure that with innovation and, and new advancement in technology that we take advantage of that to make Australian, more, more companies in Australia manufacture here. Some of the boundaries, as you said, Michelle, are higher wager costs and, of course, higher electricity costs, and the government has focused on higher electricity costs. Uh, I think all members in this place, both in the opposition and in the government and in the crossbench need to find common ground when it comes to manufacture, manufacturing. So often the opposition will accuse the government, oh, you want to you know, have more flexibility in business, uh, therefore you want to reduce workers' rights. Well, the fact is, is that's what small businesses say to us. They do need a, a little bit of flexibility and if they don't get that through the Fair Work Commission, that's why more casuals are hired. Uh, I think we also we've seen here uh, the government dealing well with unions and listening to them as well. So I think as a parliament we can learn from this. We need to be working together to support more manufacturing here. And ministers and everyone, I think we also need to look at government procurement and uh, get more of that in place where we can. There's a whole lot of more messages and I only have 30 seconds to go so I can't get to everyone. 
uh, Don Edison spoke about easing restrictions in relation to restaurants. National Cabinet had said that 10, 20 and 100 people are the stages. Obviously, 10 people in a small cafe or 10 people in a pub and club are hugely different. That was put in place mainly around the waiter, not the, the social distancing, but a waiter dealing with 10 people, then 50. But state governments have the power in this place, and obviously the states need to move as quickly as possible to get places open. Thank you. Order. The question is that the document be noted, and I call the member for Fowler. Good morning, Speaker and colleagues. Good morning. As you know, we are in unprecedented times, and the responses that require to deal with the coronavirus they are requiring uh, uh, unprecedented effort. And uh, we're only going to achieve this by um, working together. And I do, uh, I do uh, just reflect a little on the, the contribution of the member for uh, Petrie. It is something we need to uh, learn from in the way we approach this uh, coronavirus. Uh, it is not just a matter of defeating this virus. We need to actually make sure that we set the platform that we can address challenges like this into the future and uh, ensure Australia's uh, continued viability. But, um, but we, work, we must remember that uh, uh, we, we've got to stay focused on, the, on our national interests. We've got to stay focused on, on certainly the welfare of Australian people. And uh, that is not just about addressing the coronavirus. It, it is ensuring that we ensure that the uh, ongoing development of our economy uh, as, and hence why we have supported uh, the government in the, in the various markets they've laid down in the administration of, uh, of stimulus packages. Now, it is, um, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, uh, what has plagued the nation in this level of uncertainty uh, affects certainly the health and the, uh, the livelihoods of all those that we hold dear. Uh, I see it in my own family, uh, uh, whether people have been laid off work, uh, whether work's been drawn, uh, slowed up, um, whether people uh, are uh, business and are now having to make uh, various amendments to the way they're doing business or trying to do business. And uh, we supported, for that very reason, uh, the JobKeeper package. And I know there's various issues that flow from it, like if you're a university student working one shift uh, getting paid uh, $50 uh, uh, per shift uh, a week, um, uh, that you qualified for the $150 uh, a fortnight, or sorry, $1,500 a fortnight, um, part of JobKeeper. Whereas if you're actually the university lecturer uh, uh, who's been laid off by the university, you've got nothing. Now, th there are issues associated with that. And uh, the member for Petrie, I think, was right. We must show more flexibility. But the flexibility wasn't being shown at that point. I think we've got to realise where there are issues in the system that can be made better, and simply because it's been a, a advanced by the opposition doesn't mean the government needs to turn a blind eye to it. Now, uh, Mr uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Speaker, we are not unfamiliar with the issues of stimulus packages to, to meet economic challenges. You recall that back in, in the global financial crisis of 2008, we received advice, probably similar advice that the government has received from, the, uh, from Treasury, that we need to had, go hard, go fast, go early. And on this occasion, and I, I give credit to the government, they have moved in that direction. When Labor moved in that direction in 2008 and 2009, do you realise how many late night sittings we had in this place? Every piece of uh, uh, legislation giving effect to that stimulus packages was opposed. It was opposed outright and on every occasion. The, uh, the, uh, the then opposition uh, uh, moved to frustrate every aspect of stimulus package. And by the way, they've dined out on that ever since. Mm. The issue about debt and deficit has become almost a catch cry for those opposite. Not so much now. No, no, you won't hear, you won't hear a jolt of that any longer, uh, member for Werriwa, because they now know what it's like to be in government when you have to address the hard decisions. 
But you know, it's not a lesson that they just learnt, or they should have just learnt, because I just like to go back to just... It was only uh, a few months back, this year in fact, uh, addressing the Business Council of Australia. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, described the Labor's approach to the global financial crisis was wasteful and ill-disciplined. Mm, you know, that's a direct quote. And uh, by the way, uh, a month before that, the current Treasurer uh, was uh, reflecting on, on Labor's uh, approach to the, the GFC when he said these words, that um, uh, Labor was a, were panic merchants, economic nymphophytes. I was going to look that up, what it meant. And what it meant to people that are, are new to a situation. Now, boy, have they become new to a situation of recent time. But what was more important, uh, go back to the 2013 election, what was one of the core issues there, apart from issues of death and deficit, they wanted a Royal Commission into what they call the, uh, the pint bats fiasco. A Royal Commission. And the first thing that Tony Abbott did, and when he, uh, when he uh, formed government in, after 2013, was he did exactly that. He, he made good on his promise to the community, a Royal Commission into uh, the, the stimulus packages into roof insulation. Now, just to be consistent for those opposite, I haven't heard them say anything about a, a Royal Commission into the Ruby Princess yet. No. Not a word. Not, nothing about the fact that it accounts for more than 200 cases of the coronavirus in our community. And the fact that it also regrettably accounts for over 20 deaths. Now, by their own standard, provided they don't want to be tarred as hypocrites, wouldn't you think they'd have something to say about that? And by the way, I, uh, uh, I think Gladys Bedbeck-Lagerian, and uh, um, I think I've got the word right. <laughs> <laughs> Hansard will correct me. Um, I think it's... Uh, is doing a very good job. Uh, and I think the way she's approached this, uh, I know there is a police investigation occurring in terms of the Ruby Princess, but to simply uh, go out and ensure that uh, she has a judicial inquiry into this, I think uh, she's a person who has taken leadership. As a matter of fact, I commend all those who serve on the uh, National, uh, uh, the, uh, national um, Cabinet, because I think what we are seeing from them as a group is national leadership. And Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, you know, I, having said all that, you know, look, it, it is, it's certainly uh, job seeker is, uh, is something that's going to be very important to us. I cannot see uh, as a community uh, that in six months on the designated date this is going to be halved. I, that will just be sheer devastation across, across the uh, all communities. And we still need to look at wage subsidies, because businesses are not going to just snap back on that uh, six-month date uh, set in the initial legislation. So what's clear to me is that uh, despite the government's predetermined date that these are due to, uh, to conclude, um, businesses, uh, jobs, um, households, the economy, it is not going to automatically snap back. We uh, need to make sure that we are investing in the future of this country, and that that's not just a future that extends what you do in six months or to the next election. This takes a long-term commitment now to ensure that the viability of our industries can uh, once again re-establish themselves, employ uh, Australian workers, be able to actually get out and compete on the international scale, supporting our economy, and it is going to take a lot of heavy lifting by wh whoever is in government for generations. This is just something that's not going to stop at the next election or the one after that. This is going to take a significant commitment. There's just one other thing I'd like to raise in the uh, short time I have left. Deputy Speaker, you've heard me speak on many occasions that, that my electorate is very multicultural. Matter of fact, I have uh, I receive, probably the, with the member for Werriwa, the majority of um, refugees that come into this country. 
I have many, many refugees currently living in our communities, supported by charities, Sir Vincent de Paul, uh, Food Angels, uh, the Inspire Church, other groups, because they are getting nothing, and yet they are, uh, they're still, like everyone else, trying to survive. It is just something which is, uh, reflects badly on us because these people can't be uh, sent somewhere else. Uh, they're here, uh, they are human beings, we must look after them as well. I thank the member for Fowler and I call the member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a great pleasure to rise in the chamber today to commend the efforts of the government on the COVID-19 pandemic response, but to commend and thank all Australians, and particularly the residents of my electorate of Ryan, for all the sacrifices and work that they have put in to ensuring that Australia uh, has been a success in its response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, there is a lot of work still to be done uh, by any measure, but uh, I don't think it is inappropriate to take stock and to take the opportunity to take stock of just how well Australians have rallied together and helped us uh, achieve a flattening of the curve after the initial uh, health crisis. I particularly like to thank our frontline workers, um, but all residents of the Ryan electorate, because if you're not a frontline worker, if you're not working in the supermarket or if you're not working at the respiratory clinic or whatever it may be, uh, you, are, you are probably uh, having your job affected and making incredible sacrifices uh, to keep your fellow Australians safe. Uh, and making those sacrifices uh, in terms of your employment prospects and your work and your financial uh, situation. So thank you to all of Australians. Uh, I really uh, support very strongly uh, the approach that the Prime Minister and the um, Minister Health, Minister Hunt has taken uh, to set the priority for our nation when COVID first uh, started to, uh, to really bite, uh, to set the priority uh, that we were going to uh, make sure that the health uh, response came first, that we were going to prioritise the health of every Australian and that we were going to work together as a community to make sure that we protected the health and lives of our fellow Australians. Uh, every death that has occurred because of COVID-19 uh, is uh, horrible and we grieve with those families who have lost uh, loved ones as we would uh, grieve for members of our own family and that is why uh, Order. A uh, division has been called in the House uh, and to facilitate voting by members, the proceedings of the Federation Chamber are suspended and will resume at the conclusion of uh, the division or subsequent divisions. Call the member for Ryan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. As I was saying, um, I'd like to uh, thank all the residents of the Ryan electorate for the work that they have put in to banding together with their fellow Australians to help us uh, tackle this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, the government stands firmly with them, with over 300 billion in support, an unprecedented level of support uh, to help Australians. Uh, rally together and make sure that we both tackle the health crisis have, as we have done and to keep the virus suppressed, but also now to get our economy back uh, up and going again. Uh, the results that we have achieved, I think, as I said, I think it's fair to take an opportunity to take stock. Uh, our, they are simply the envy of the world. Our preparedness and our comprehensive, swift and decisive action early on have seen a flattened curve and a health system now, as, the, um, as Minister Hunt outlined in his ministerial statement, a health system with the capability to deal with the future outbreaks and, most importantly, uh, to save lives like, as we need to. The response has led uh, to the ultimate goal, saving lives and saving livelihoods. When we look around the world at the terrible impact that the virus has wrought on nations that are close to our heart, like the US and the UK, we realise how truly lucky we are uh, to have achieved what we have. Minister Hunt and his team have led us through this unprecedented crisis along with the Prime Minister and achieved results that many thought impossible just a few months ago. I thank them as I have thanked uh, all Australians and members of uh, the Ryan electorate. 
They didn't act alone. We've all had to make huge sacrifices. It's had a huge impact on people's lives. They've stayed at home. They've followed advice from government and, uh, and medical experts. They've taken up hygiene practices. They've downloaded the app uh, and they continue to live in a COVID safe uh, way. We're also well ahead when it comes to testing, and this is an incredibly important element to keeping our nation safe. It's through our hardworking health professionals across the country that we've been able to enhance and increase our testing regime to the extent that we have and the extent that is needed. We are relying on them now more than ever, and they have truly stepped up to the task. This week, we opened our 100th respiratory clinic across Australia, funded by the federal government. And these clinics now allow allow for anyone experiencing respiratory symptoms that are mild to moderate. So these are a sore throat, a cough, as you saw with our treasurer early in the week, a runny nose, uh, to go and get uh, tested. Uh, being on top of testing means that we are on top of the virus, which we are, and we can keep it suppressed. I particularly like to acknowledge the respiratory clinic in my own electorate of Ryan, uh, where a few weeks ago it opened up and it's led by Kenmore Clinics and the fantastic team there of Dr uh, Nick Burke and others uh, who are doing a great job of getting it up and running so fast for our community. I had the opportunity to tour through the clinic uh, with them uh, before them opening uh, to patients. They took, them through, they took me through all the requirements and systems and processes that they had in place to keep both their patients safe but also uh, the medical team uh, safe uh, there as well. Uh, they did a fan they're doing a fantastic job and as I said, they're truly at the front line, uh, but they do it willingly and they do it because they are as keen as all of us to make sure that they support the health of their local community. I'd now like, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, if I could to turn my uh, focus to an area of health that will no doubt be an ongoing focus I know it's an ongoing focus for myself, but uh, I am certain will now be an ongoing focus for this government, and that is mental health and our mental health response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, I reached out to every resident of the Ryan electorate via their letterboxes to let them know about the support, the mental health support that is available to them, both, both uh, from the government, but also uh, some fantastic private and community not-for-profits that are doing uh, great work. It's something that I'm particularly passionate about, uh, in particular at this time when so many Australians are doing it tough. So many of them are anxious about uh, the future. But as Minister, Hel Minister Hunt said yesterday, just as the government is modelling the spread of COVID-19 infection to continue flattening the curve, we're also closely monitoring mental health service usage so we can respond quickly and lessen the mental health impacts of the pandemic. This means we know, as Australians do, that we are not out of the woods yet. Uh, we also know that the impacts of COVID-19 will be felt for many months and many years ahead. So it is vital that we have a plan for the mental health of Australians and the well-being and their well-being as we continue on the road out. On Friday at the National Cabinet, some more detail around this will be presented. We'll be working with the state governments in conjunction with them, using all the resources that the Commonwealth and our National Federation has available to it, to make sure that all Australians know that there is help available for them. Just as we did with the health aspects of this crisis, we are getting ahead of the curve when it comes to tackling the mental health impacts that this pandemic is ha having and will continue to have. We are lucky to have incredible support agencies in this country. Headspace, Beyond Blue, Lifeline, Kids Helpline, the Black Dog Institute, just to name a few. They are doing a brilliant job in these heightened conditions and this government will continue to make sure that they are well resourced so they are up to the task. Not long ago in my electorate of Ryan, prior to the coronavirus, I visited the local Headspace Centre at Turinga as they celebrated their fifth birthday. It was really a moving uh, occasion as several past patients of the centres sp uh, spoke about their stories, which was incredibly courageous of them, talking about their journey from day one where they decided to take the step to seek help. They sought that help with Headspace. They found a home and a place where they felt comfortable to talk about their anxieties and their concerns of the future, and they found uh, that support and that confidence that they needed. And it's uh, for some of them, it has truly transformed 
their lives. Those, um, uh, so in, in a time when many of us are facing that uncertainty, whether it be through a concern for our health or the health of our family, financial security or job security, it is so important that each and every Australian knows that whatever your concern is, you do not have to face it alone. There's been much uh, talk of a simple phrase used uh, throughout the world during this pandemic, that isolation does not mean you're alone. We understand that Australians who are staying at home and doing their part are feeling removed from their friends, their families and their support networks. And that is why we are quick to uh, put in place a range of additional resources to better connect Australians. At the end of March, we announced 74 million uh, commitment to support the mental health and well-being of Australians. We established Head to Health, a digital portal for all Australians, a single source of information, an important online tool to seek help. Uh, it has some key focuses for Australians. Maintain a healthy lifestyle, stay positive, stay informed, access support. I encourage all residents of the Ryan electorate and all Australians who need that support to go to Head to Health our digital uh, portal. We are all here to support you. Thank the you. question is that the document be noted, and I call the member for McNamara. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I rise to join uh, many of the colleagues um, here in this quite extraordinary and historic times um, to take note on the ministerial statement provided by the Minister for um, Health and responded to by the Shadow Minister for Health on the COVID-19 um, pandemic. These are extraordinary and historic times. These are times that few of us could have predicted that we were going to be living through in 2020. It got off to a, a really devastating start for many Australians through the bushfires and only a few months later, Australians are, uh, are find themselves in probably the largest um, health and economic challenge that we have ever faced in all of our collective lifetimes. And, um, and it has changed life dramatically as we know it in Australia. And I think today, um, there's a few people that I want to say thank you to, um, as well as talk about some of the things that we can use this pandemic in order to improve our country and improve our society. Um, but first of all, I think it's worth saying that this is obviously not an easy time to be in, co to be in government, but it is, an, uh, it is possibly the most important time to be in government. And I know that uh, many members on the other side um, including the minister and obviously um, senior government ministers would have worked pretty hard over this period, but so would have their staff. And um, I haven't heard them being acknowledged enough in this um, discussion. And I'm sure there are a lot of government staff who um, have put their own lives on pause um, for the last few months. As, as someone who's been a government staffer for um, a period of time, it, it, can be a, <laughs> it can be a pretty demanding and thankless job at times. And, um, and I, I just want to acknowledge the work that many of them have done. Um, I also would say that there has been an air and a tone put by the government that, that, you know, that they've done a great job and, and this is all over and that's, and that's all in the past now. But to be honest, I, couldn't think, I don't think it could be further from the truth that this pandemic, Deputy Speaker, um, is only just beginning. It is only just beginning. We are at the foot of the mountain and hopefully the number of cases in Australia remain um, at a low level but I, um, I fear that they might not. Um, I fear that with restrictions being opened up as they are around the country, that we will see an increase in cases, which means we will see people losing their lives to this devastating virus. And um, it also means that a prolonged economic hurt, which as many speakers have outlined before, has a range of other personal and health consequences that we need to acknowledge. Um, I think that the Prime Minister, one good thing that the Prime Minister did was establish a national cabinet. I think the Premier's contribution to the National Cabinet has been um, profound throughout this whole entire pandemic, and I especially want to acknowledge um, the leadership shown by the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews um, and the Chief Health Officer Brett Sutton, who have had the go hard, go early um, approach to this, that they haven't waited to be right um, in order to act and in order to act decisively to protect and save as many lives as possible. Um, and that absolutely is the right approach um, that they've made. I also want to acknowledge um, the nurses, the doctors, the cleaners, the health workers, the mental health workers, the people who have picked up the phone on Beyond Blue, um, people who are on our front line of this health crisis who um, in, in many ways and in many days have put their own personal health and wellbeing um, 
on the line in order to save other people. And we've heard many instances, both in Australia and around the world, of um, doctors and nurses having to um, potentially put themselves in harm's way in order to save others. And um, it is a truly remarkable thing to see our health workers um, fight in the same heroic spirit that our firefighters did during the bushfires, and they should be recognised as such. Um, personally, I want to thank David Forbes, who's a professor of mental health, who um, joined me for a conversation um, a few weeks ago, um, talking about some of the ways in which we can all cope with uh, the mental health and um, challenges and the anxiety that people are facing. And he, um, along with many of his colleagues, um, are doing a fabulous job in, in helping people adapt to the changes of society that we're facing. Our supermarket workers, our delivery drivers, um, have done a stoic job and turned up to work um, in the face of probably some of the most difficult days of this pandemic, of people really feeling the panic and the anxiety of what it means to be living through this pandemic and taking it out on some of our workers who are literally keeping us alive, who are keeping the, the supply chains um, alive to people. And um, I, I absolutely want to recognise um, the, the stoic job that our supermarket um, workers, our, our restaurant, our food suppliers, our delivery drivers um, have done in Australia. They have fed Australians, they've kept Australians at home safely um, and they've done a wonderful job and, and we really thank them. Um, our aged care workers, it's been really hard. My, we haven't been able to see my grandmother um, throughout this entire pandemic, or no, nor my parents, but we can speak to her on speak to them on Zoom. It's been far more accessible. But my my grandmother has been isolated throughout this entire pandemic, and um, and it's it's been really hard. But I thank all of the workers who have been looking after her, and, and all of the other um, all of the other residents who are finding themselves in a in a pretty vulnerable position in aged care homes, um, as we've seen. Our teachers and early educators um, are, uh, were right to be nervous at the start and I'm really glad obviously to see kids slowly coming back to school but um, this is a nervous time for them as someone who spent a little bit of time in the classroom to try and get four and five year olds to socially distance is uh, akin to herding cats. Um, that they can be, they can be um, at times unruly but, um, but our teachers and I think many parents have seen and had a newfound sense of appreciation for our teachers um, throughout, this, this, um, um, throughout this crisis. Um, and so for parents and kids who are going through this, thank you for all your efforts throughout the country. It has been a collective experience and a collective effort for us all to get through it. I think that there are some things to mention, um, Acting Speaker, before we move on, is that our number one health measure our number one health, uh, preventative health measure that we have, have um, needed throughout this pandemic has been our housing. And we've all been instructed you need to stay at home in order to protect yourself and each other throughout this pandemic. But that is just simply impossible if you don't have a home. It's simply impossible if your home is not a safe place to be for you as well. And um, this pandemic has shown a spotlight on how important our housing is to our society, how important our housing is. Um, to our individual health and sense of um, safety and security. Um, and to be frank, our housing system was broken before this crisis. Our waiting lists were um, too long. It took way too long to be able to get into a house if you needed one. Um, there simply isn't enough housing in Australia. And one of the things that we can do inside, um, at, coming at the back of this coronavirus, um, is to build more homes. Um, we, we need to be building more homes, not just um, homes to, to buy for investment properties, but homes for people, for young people to be able to purchase for their first homes and, and affordable homes for people to be able to live in in order to protect themselves and society because this isn't going away. We're also going to need economic drivers and stimulus that is going to need to happen inside Australia and building homes is going to be a perfect thing. It happened after um, the Great Depression, um, FDR, um, the great president, um, started a huge housing investment in order to um, make housing more secure. After World War II, it was Curtin and Chifley who undertook a huge housing construction program. And even after the um, global financial crisis, the Rudd government um, embarked on a huge social housing um, investment program in order to kickstart the economy and provide people with housing. Um, we, need to be do, we need to do better to help people through casual and insecure work. 
Um, many people in my electorate, especially our artists, our hospitality workers, our tourism workers, I am so lucky to be um, representing the great um, parts of St Kilda and Elwood and Port Melbourne. These are some of Melbourne's iconic suburbs, but these are also some of the areas that have been hit hardest in this economic crisis. Um, and that has a whole range of health and economic consequences that we need to be recognising and rectifying. These are businesses and, and workers and creative um, institutions that need our support at this time, and they should be allowed to access JobKeeper. They should be accessing. Um, they should be accessing some of the government services, and the government should be doing more to be supporting those industries and those workers. And finally, I just want to make this point: is that this has been a really difficult period of government, no doubt. In Victoria, I think the Victorian government has done an outstanding job in focusing on saving Victorian lives. And it takes a special kind of self-indulgence to make a pandemic or a crisis of this nature um, to be focused all about one's own political party. And unfortunately, the Victorian Liberal Party has done just that. Their self-indulgent, late-night tweeting, focus on things like golf and getting bats out of leafy suburbs of Melbourne have been nothing but schoolyard political games that they should be ashamed of. Um, they have only shown that they are unfit for government at the same time where the Victorian government has shown that they are focused on saving Victorian lives. I call the member for Barara. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Everyday decisions taken in this building determine the direction of our country. But in recent weeks, there's been immediacy to the consequences of our decisions. Over these weeks, I've listened to people describe the decisions they are trying to take in their own lives about whether to take on more debt for a business whose future cannot be certain. Do they cut their losses and find a new path, or do they defend what they've spent years building, even if it costs them in retirement? I've listened to the sighs of relief when JobKeeper was announced, as people told me they could finally see beyond the next few weeks. I've known that the frameworks that we set in place for childcare funding would not just make a difference to family budgets, but would mean the viability of businesses, the survival of careers and the well-being of our youngest Australians. I've spoken to doctors desperately trying to serve patients over the telephone, worried about the mental health of those living alone. And personally, I've watched my wife's grandmother peer over the gate at her great-grandson, desperate to catch just a glimpse of him, even though he didn't understand why he had to be held back and couldn't run to her. Being a representative of a community at this time means feeling the weight of each person's circumstances and doing the best we can to act on their behalf. It's meant speaking to ministers' offices and departments to try and work out how to give the 100, 120,000 people of Barara whatever lifeline we can. It's also meant helping Australians who are caught abroad to find avenues home. It's been humbling and a great honour as it is every day in this job. It's also been humbling to watch our community respond. On Anzac Day this year, I was more hopeful than ever about the compact between the generations of Australians, as young people honoured those who have served in our armed services, not at a majestic march or a solemn service, but quietly in front of their homes. Watching online as Evie Morrison from North Home Grammar played the last post on the flute against the backdrop of a cloud-clad Hawkesbury River is a moment etched on my mind. I'll never forget the moving, unique Anzac Day dawn service standing at the front of our home, watching as our neighbours came out one by one into their driveways to create a small, silent, simple ceremony which underscored the bonds between our fellow Australians, which seems stronger today than at any time I can remember. Community organisations in my electorate are doing amazing work. Meals on Wheels have adapted how they operate to make sure the service wouldn't need to shut down if someone was infected and broaden the people they serve to cater for those in isolation. Churches like Barara Baptist, Thornley Community Baptist and Normanhurst Uniting are shopping for people who are isolated, calling people who may need help, and in the case of Barara Baptist, adopting single people into their families to be the one visitor a householder could have. Lifeline Harbour to Hawkesbury has answered more than 19,000 calls over the past two months. Fusion, the Dish and Hornsby Connect have expanded their food services to continue to feed people facing hardship. Parents Beyond Breakup took their meetings online and found that it opened up support to many people who wouldn't otherwise have attended but who are feeling particularly help helpless. Their meeting attendance has doubled. Childcare centres have continued to provide safe and secure places so critical workers can keep doing their work, offering children a nurturing and educational environment where the world outside their doors seems uncertain. 
Schools have demonstrated extraordinary resilience, not only in adapting to online learning with incredible speed, but going above and beyond to show care and support to their students. And parents challenged by trying to educate their children at home have a new respect for teachers. This has also been a time of grief. Funerals with limited attendance have been a particular hardship. And I think of many people who've had to grieve at a distance, who've been unable to say goodbye, and for whom the loss of a loved one has been made so much more complex. There's been a gripping fear for some who've not known whether financial obligations can be met and whether everything that has been worked for will be lost. For some, there's been enormous endurance to spend time in close quarters with people who are difficult to be with, and fraught relationships have not had an easy release valve. This has also been a time of learning. Lots of sentences have begun with, all I really want is, followed by the listing of simple things which we often take for granted. The health of our families, a barbecue at the park with friends, the smell of coffee brewed by a good barista, the chance to drop children off at the school gate. We've paid fresh attention to the simple parts of our lives and we've realised that the things that matter to us most sometimes don't get much room on our to-do lists. We've been reminded how much we love our elderly family and friends. We've had time to teach our children to tie their shoes or ride their bikes. And we've learnt that we can adapt faster than we thought. We've sped up the processes that, we, that will serve us well going forward. Telehealth services were expanded out of necessity, but the service makes so much sense that we should look at holding on to it. Similarly, we've learned how to work in more flexible ways and to focus on the things that matter, not just the busyness itself. This week marks a particularly significant turn towards recovery. In New South Wales, our schools are up and running. Family visits have resumed, and on the weekend, I'll be able to sit down for a moment at my local cafe to read the news and have some food. Activity that's been on hold is just starting to resume. And while I don't want to understate the difficulties Australians face, as a society, we need to take stock of the pace of our lives before COVID-19 and reflect on the opportunities we've had to slow things down and work out how we'll spend more time on the important rather than forever chasing the urgent. We now have an opportunity to address some of the challenges that we've had in the too hard basket and to move into the recovery with fresh perspective. I want to say three things about the recovery phase. First, we've been reminded that the economic fundamentals of Australia are very good. In particular, the crisis has reminded us about the importance of having a free, open, modern economy. When we talk about the economy, we're not talking about a nebulous concept. We're talking about every exchange we make with our neighbours, every pipe laid by a plumber, every plant propagated at a nursery, every necklace made by a jeweller, every haircut at the barber. It's the great activity of life and culture that we want to restore. A strong economy means all this activity being free to happen, accessing the capital it needs to get going, seeing return on that investment, exchanging and trading as it should. It means farmers sending food to other parts of the world and it means supplies coming here to let us build machines to make our work more efficient. We've spent the last two months getting used to the government telling us what to do. This should not last. As with post-war reconstruction, the government will need to do a lot by way of planning and managing, more than it would need to in usual times, but this must always be in the service of free industry and activity of the Australian people. History tells us that governments that hold on to controls too long inevitably face the backlash of a free people. Ultimately, governments can never plan or manage the incredibly vibrant, creative, diverse and versatile activity that the free market can produce. Every decision we take, even those to plan and manage our way out of the crisis, must have as the ultimate goal of placing responsibility back in the hands of all of us to keep our economy and our community strong. Second, we've seen some of the fault lines in our services and infrastructure in recent, recent weeks, and it's time to sort them out. Telecommunications has been absolutely inadequate in my community, and no doubt in other places too. We cannot afford to keep ignoring this. I believe Telstra has a particular responsibility in this regard, as their service is absolutely woeful in my electorate, and it's time they stepped up. Telco should be like turning on the tap and getting water, and yet these last two months have shown us how essential it is for modern life. I will not let this issue go. Transport also needs to be improved. The average commute in Sydney is well over an hour every day, and the time people have had back in their lives without sitting in traffic has made a major difference to the well-being of everyone. We have to continue to improve Sydney's transport by investing significantly in infrastructure projects like North Connects. Third and finally, I want to say something about immigration. The Shadow Immigration Minister made some injudicious comments recently about immigration and overseas workers in this country. As Chair of the Joint Committee on Migration, let me be clear. 
Migration should be part of Australia's future. Skilled migration creates jobs. When people want to commit to Australia as their home, when they want to integrate, work and serve this community and be part of building our future, and when that desire matches the needs and interests of the Australian community, we should celebrate it. In my committee work, I recently met a business in Mount Gambier that's been able to employ 50 local people, including people with disabilities, because of the migration of two skilled pastry chefs from the Philippines to do a job in a location that no Australian was willing or qualified to do. Those migrants came to Australia and shared their skills and trained five apprentices, who then in turn trained others and grew the business. To play cheap politics with immigration ultimately puts our economic well-being at risk. In recent weeks, Deputy Speaker, Australia has been tested. We've demonstrated that this is the best place on earth. In Australia, things work. COVID-19 has reminded us how much that we have that is good. Outstanding political leadership, a well-functioning government and institutions that can rise to the challenge, the world's best healthcare system, dedication to the value of every life and every person, no matter how old or how sick, a culture of responsibility and social concern. Deputy Speaker, it is these things that I'm committed to defending and these things that are worth fighting for as we move into the next phase of this recovery. Yeah. Thank, I thank the member for the contribution. The question is that the document be noted. I call on the member for Macquarie. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The people of the Blue Mountains and Hawkesbury have had a hell of a 2020. The smoke from bushfires had barely cleared, allowing us to breathe again and open businesses and allow tourists to return when coronavirus hit. At times, the Blue Mountains has been considered a hotspot of the COVID-19, with people urged to be tested for even the slightest symptom. Our distilleries ditched gin for sanitizer. Hawkesbury's Carew Distillery supplied as much high-proof spirit to be used as a sanitizer as they could to essential services such as charities, police and food services. Owners Nick and Aliers wanted to help out any way they could. And Lee Etherington from Wild Hibiscus Flower Company also confessed to me at one point that he'd sacrificed a thousand litres of his best crafted gin into sanitizer. He just wanted to help. This sacrifice was being repeated in small and medium businesses all over my electorate. And small business has really shown enormous innovation and creativity. And I hope that my Macquarie Marketplace map has been a help and made it easier for people to find out which businesses were still trading and were still open, particularly at the height of the restrictions. Like many members, people flooded my office with calls to check that they were obeying the rules because they wanted to be part of protecting the community from the most serious health crisis that anyone living has seen. And we pulled together, most people managing to put politics aside to work for the common good, the health of every person in our community. But we weren't unscathed, and sadly the deaths at the New March aged care facility on our doorstep have meant local families have tragically lost loved ones, and others have had an anxious wait as family members remain in New March. Throughout all of this, the nursing staff of aged care facilities have kept on caring. Nurses in hospitals have kept on caring. Doctors and admin staff, supported by the heroes of our time, cleaners, have kept on caring. I've spoken to nurses who, having been exposed to COVID-19, spent two weeks in isolation to make sure they hadn't contracted the virus, returning to work to continue that care on the very first day that they could. We really got to know who the essential workers are, and I hope we appreciate them more. And I'm stunned to hear suggestions from the New South Wales government that workers like nurses are facing a possible pay freeze. Some thanks for the risks that they've taken. I was able to show the community's appreciation in a very small way by delivering some sweet treats to our local hospitals, Hawkesbury, Springwood and Blue Mountains, drawing on local businesses like Auntie May's in Bullaburra and the Humble Bakery in Bly Park and the Ori Cafe in Springwood, just something to help brighten their afternoon in their relentless work. You really can't thank essential workers for their efforts in this health crisis without talking about teachers. 
While there's no denying that it's been a really confusing time for teachers, principals and parents, they've all been desperate to understand the health advice about whether they can be back in the classroom and how best to be back in the classroom. The creation of online modules, the supervision of children of essential workers in the school, often the juggling of homeschooling of their own children, protecting themselves and their families, all of this has meant a huge load for members of the teaching profession, and we thank them. And of course, the anxiety for casual teachers who were excluded from the JobKeeper program. And that starts to touch on the second major health issue that my constituents and many others face, how to maintain good mental health in the face of a terribly uncertain and troublesome time. Deputy Speaker, another profession carrying a big burden are the early learning profession. Workers in the full range of childcare and early learning environments, from family day carers to preschools and long day care centres, have faced an unprecedented situation where their clients are receiving free childcare. Now, while on this side of the house we have a deep belief in the importance of quality early learning and love the principle of free childcare, none of us expected the people to be paying the price for the free childcare would be the centres themselves or their workers. It's complicated criteria that the government has applied and directors tell me that they're still coming to terms with it and how they provide the quality learning environment they want with an income that's capped. Their income is capped but the number of children who come back as restrictions eased is not. The bluntness of JobKeeper as a wage subsidy tool means newer casuals don't qualify and it leads to some part-timers earning more and some full-timers earning less and directors have rostering nightmares. I've been grateful to the family day carers like Moochie Kids and Cubby House and the directors of Hawkesbury and Blue Mountain Centres who've Zoomed with me and shared with me the challenges and the lengths that they've gone to to keep their children safe. I say to them, you've let me into the anxious world that you're surviving in, and you've allowed, allowed me and Labor to advocate on your behalf. Parents, though, are also feeling the stress from the one who's called because they were worried their centre might close, to people like Kieran Ashton, who wants his youngest daughter to join his son at Cubby House in coming months, and recognises that Tracy won't get paid for it. And he's happy to pay, but he isn't allowed. So it's a system with flaws. Early learning on George in the Hawkesbury is one centre battling bureaucracy. Director Karen Nightingale tried to have her numbers reassessed through exceptional circumstances because her centre had two days of low numbers when a tree had fallen in storms across the centre's backyard during the reporting period. Now, her application was rejected based on her post-COVID numbers. But Karen tells me she's seeing an increase in attendances and will be back to 97% capacity for every day next week, but funding it on the lower income. Now, while Karen recognises JobKeeper has made a massive difference and we knew a wage subsidy would, and that's why we badgered the government and we're pleased they introduced it, but Karen hasn't got funding for all the children returning next week without a review of her income. So these are the challenges that people are facing day to day. I can't stress how important the financial security is to help people keep good mental health at this time. To even suggest that financial support is to be wound back or reviewed in some way, or you have to keep proving eligibility, is a really cruel thing to do. And especially given that only this week is JobKeeper money starting to get into most people's accounts. Deputy Speaker, there are so many frontline people who have carried us through this difficult time and will continue to as, it, as this health crisis goes on. Uh, the supermarket workers, the drivers who've made sure deliveries get to the door, those people who, who work 24 hours a day in some cases to keep those supermarket shelves stocked and restocked deserve our thanks. Another very visible frontline worker is the Centrelink worker. And I was really pleased to be able to help the Centrelink workers at Katoomba, Springwood and Windsor take a moment to have coffee or donuts, just as a small gesture of thanks for the long queues, the distressed people they've been trying to help through this process. I also want to commend the volunteers in my electorate who helped me reach out to older people. Uh, people like Christy and Jules, Shane and Anne, Suzanne and Catherine, 
uh, who made nearly a thousand calls to older people just to check that they were okay. Uh, some of them were quick chats and some were much lengthier conversations and hopefully that helped people at a time when they may have been very alone and isolated in their homes. We were also able to solve a few other problems for them and we'll continue to do that because this isn't over and we know that and as a community we all have to accept that. Also want to single out, Deputy Speaker, the arts sector. We have a huge arts community in the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury. And it's not just the people who are the front people, the actors and the lead singers. It's the band that sits behind them. It's the roadies who get their gear on stage. It's the producers, it's the lighting operators, the stage hands, it's the filmmakers. There are so many professions connected to it. Uh, within theatres, it's the people who sell the tickets, who give you, sell you a drink at the bar at interval. Many of these people are missing out on any government support because the arts sector often has very short-term contracts, so people don't, haven't qualified for JobKeeper. I'd really urge the government to listen to the arts sector. We have relied on them while we've been in a much more closer to home uh, routine. We've listened to them, we've watched them. We need all these people to be ready to get back on stage for us uh, when coronavirus uh, allows us, when it's under greater control and allows us to get back outside more and to meet in larger groups. I really beg the government to step up to this. These are ordinary people in my community and they need your help. In fact, this government needs to keep supporting people as we move through what will continue to be challenging times. I thank the member for the contribution. The question is that the document be noted. I call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak about something that's very close to my heart um, and very close to the heart of many members in this um, chamber, including the member for Bowman and the member for Lyne. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the good work that the members who in this house are members of, have been members of our medical profession and research sector because we have had bipartisan support with regards to our COVID response. Um, and we are very proud of what this Morrison government has achieved um, right from the very get go with the coronavirus pandemic. So let's just wind back to the end of January. In fact, earlier than that, because at uh, as early as early January, reports were coming through about um, an unknown new virus, novel virus, the coronavirus. And we should be very proud of the fact that our medical research community, which has been well funded um, over many years, although I will always advocate for more funding for medical research, being um, an area I think that we can grow and continue to grow and develop, but that has a huge amount of resourcefulness about the funds that we do have, uh, is that we had a very, very quick response with regards to developing a test uh, so that we could identify the coronavirus caseload that was here in Australia. And in fact, we were way ahead of the rest of the world. Um, if, we, if you look to the US, uh, they were six weeks behind the development of a test to identify where the coronavirus um, was indeed uh, grasping a foothold um, in their community. So Australia was on the front foot with regards to identifying testing, but we were also on the front foot with regards to identifying the impact that coronavirus uh, was going to have on, on the whole world. And in fact, two weeks before the WHO um, decided to call this a COVID pandemic, uh, Australia had actually already identified that this was going to be a problem. And from a public health research point of view, as someone who has experience in public health, I was in incredibly pleased that we were on the front foot with regards to containing coronavirus from reaching our shores. And there are many public health measures that we took very early on uh, to some levels of criticism from the international community, which is now looked as being a very, very uh, thoughtful, considered and prepared response. And the first one was to ensure that those that were those Australian Chinese who were returning from Wuhan uh, were offered quarantine on Christmas Island, followed shortly by the Diamond Princess cruise passengers being offered quarantine at Howard Springs. And I have actually had a number of constituents that were on the Diamond Princess and worked 
hand in glove with the authorities to make sure that those uh, citizens were safely returned to Australia. We then had uh, a number of border controls put in place with regards to uh, travel from mainland China, followed quickly by Iran, South uh, Korea and then Italy. And those measures, I believe, I firmly believe, were probably the most important measures to ensure that Australia has managed to carve its own curve. Uh, but the second set of measures, uh, which we should uh, congratulate all Australians for engaging in, was the, the public health measure of both quarantining uh, those who uh, have coronavirus, those who are at high risk of coronavirus, so that at the moment includes cruise ship passengers and international um, travellers returning from overseas, but uh, secondly, the physical and social distancing that all Australians have um, undertaken uh, with, I would say, a good deal of grace because it is not easy for people to have had to undertake social distancing and physical distancing. It's had a profound impact on people's lives, on their mental health, and on their ability to enjoy um, their lives with their families, and also the impact it has had on people's ability to run their businesses or to have jobs. And so we know that the social licence that has been lent to um, the government to undertake uh, good health practice measures um, is something that I think all Australians should feel very, very proud of. Um, so moving on from those important public health measures, um, we should really, really congratulate the Minister for Health uh, the uh, Chief Health, uh, Chief Medical Officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, and the National Cabinet uh, that have been formed by good health advice, good medical advice, good public health advice, um, and had, has included both the federal and the state and territory authorities to ensure that our flattening of the curve has provided us time to prepare for a future. And so if we wind back even just two months ago, it was very clear that uh, COVID was taking off overseas, but we did not know whether it was going to be problematic here in Australia. But we needed to prepare. And with a huge amount of um, focused and directed work, uh, the Department of Health has prepared our healthcare system for what may lay ahead. And that has in included a huge amount of investment and preparedness in three areas. And that first area is the area of intensive care. So we increased our capacity from 2,200 ventilated beds to 7,500. It's a wonderful problem to have that we haven't yet had to use those ventilator beds, but if we wind back simply two months, there was a great fear that we were going to have an overwhelmed healthcare system. And if we look to Italy, if we look to the UK, and now to the US, we can see that is exactly what's happened. And we have all heard those horror stories from New York um, and from Italy, where there have been triaging of people who have been at um, very critical stages um, of their health, um, and that terrible decisions have had to be made by healthcare practitioners around the world, which has been very worrying. But because we've been prepared, because we've flattened the curve, we've been able to make sure that we have those ventilating beds that are available. The second issue is PPE equipment. And I think we should be very proud of the investment that has been made in ensuring our supply chain to ensure that there is enough PPE equipment. Mm -hmm. The third area that is of great import is telehealth. And Australians, um, I think we will have a legacy going forward with regards to telehealth. I think um, Australians understand that having to take hours off work in order to go and sit in a waiting room um, to see a doctor can sometimes be rather inconvenient. And telehealth has provided an ability for frontline doctors to get off the front line during this COVID pandemic. It's allowed patients to not have to go to an environment where they may be at risk of coronavirus. And it has ensured that um, we have been able to protect our PP supply when we had some critical issues with the, the supply chain. So those factors have been very important. But the third factor that has been very, very fourth factor has been very, very important is our testing capability. And again, I'd like to congratulate um, the resources that have been put into making sure that we have sufficient testing to um, be able to assess who is at risk of coronavirus, to expand uh, the testing capabilities. I know personally colleagues around the world um, are in great admiration with our ability to test um, our general and um, highly symptomatic population. I have colleagues in the UK who themselves have had um, coronavirus, both the, 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 the wife and, and husband. Uh, they've had three children, have had symptoms, and I asked them, did you go and get uh, test testing for coronavirus for your children? And they said, no, we didn't bother. Um, we know there's a lot of under-testing going on in other places because they haven't had the supply 
supply chains, they haven't had the resources, they haven't had the investment by health um, in the acute healthcare sector. But finally, I'd like to talk about the, the significant uh, investment that the Department of Health has made in the support of the health and wellbeing of Australians. Um, and we should really congratulate um, this government in ensuring that we understand the long-term implications that the changes to our economy may ha have on the mental health um, of all Australians. And so uh, we've worked in conjunction with peak organisations, including Beyond Blue and the Black Dog Institute, to establish the support services to help people through the pandemic, including targeted initiatives for frontline health workers. We've bolstered mental health support providers facing an unprecedented surge in calls through a $10 million investment to expand their capabilities, and we've provided extra support for senior Australians to help them connect online. We've also provided extra support for health space, Headspace. Sorry. Headspace is such an important um, uh, mental health support institute, um, but through their digital work, we're able to provide a $6.75 million investment. And we've also developed culturally appropriate mental health and wellbeing resources uh, for Indigenous Australians and increased support for Commonwealth community mental health clients with a $28 million investment. Overall, the Morrison government has invested $8 billion in our COVID health and mental health response. This is unprecedented. It's been targeted. It's had very clear outcomes of what we've been um, aiming to achieve. And three months ago, it's hard to imagine what we're seeing as a devastating outcome around the world with hundreds of thousands of coronavirus cases and tens of thousands of deaths. And it isn't over overseas. It isn't over around the world, but Australia has contained this epidemic and with the COVID Safe app, which I encourage everyone watching this to download now, we have a way for the first time in the history of mankind, an ability to contain, control and to track COVID if we are to get outbreaks going forward to prevent a resurgence and to help keep all Australians safe now and into the future. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Higgins for that contribution. The question is that the document be noted. I call on the member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is widespread acknowledgement that Australia has managed the COVID-19 outbreak better than most other countries. That's the result of a nation led by the federal government, and I acknowledge that, um, acting on the advice of experts, working as one with um, other state government jurisdictions, with opposition parties across Australia, working constructively in the national interest. In looking forward, we must continue to put the national interest first because we are not in the clear yet. Nor have all of the economic impacts surfaced and hit home. Mr Deputy Speaker, in beginning my remarks, um, I begin by expressing my sincere sympathies to those families that have been hit particularly hard, families of the 98 people who have already lost their lives, others who faced life-threatening moments in their lives, those that were unable to visit their elderly parents in nursing homes and the like, or weren't able to attend weddings and even worse, funerals of loved ones. These are significant defining moments in a person's life that these people have missed out on. And I'm sure it will be part of their life um, as they go into the future. One of the consoling reminders about all of this is that it could have been worse for Australia. And that is true. And it wasn't worse because I believe that this nation worked together as one. But it could have been worse had it not been for all of the health workers, the aged care workers, the child care workers, the teachers, the police, the emergency service workers, the uh, people that worked at Centrelink and the tax offices, in the supermarkets, and wherever they kept the economy and this country ticking over. To all of those people, and I can't list them all individually, I say thank you because it was a, as a result of your input that this nation got through this in the way, or got through it to this point in the way that it has. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I, as I reflect back on the past three months, there are some issues that I want to briefly touch on. And first is the issue of racism. COVID-19 has seen a worldwide flare-up of racism against 
Asian people in particular. It has been fuelled by the constant reference, including by US President Trump, to the Chinese virus. Mr Deputy Speaker, I simply say this. Racism exists and it always has. But when it leads to violence against innocent people because of their skin colour or their appearance, it is simply not acceptable and it should be condemned. Secondly, Mr Deputy Speaker, I turn to the support measures. And again, I commend the government for the measures that it brought in. They were necessary and well-intentioned. And can I say, um, this side of politics has supported them in every step of the way. However, there are too many Australians that have fallen through the gaps. Over a million people that were not entitled to the JobKeeper PAC, uh, uh, support because they were in casual employment or part-time employment, where for trivial reasons, such as that they didn't quite meet the 12-month employment criteria and things such as that, they missed out. There were students, council workers, the over 5,000 Donata workers, people in the arts sector, people in charities and in the universities, all because of, I believe, unintended consequences have missed out on a legitimate entitlement in line with what others were getting. Now, the government could easily close those gaps and they have the opportunity and the ability to do so. My understanding is that the government predicted that there would be some six million Australians that will be supported with the JobKeeper package. It's unlikely that we'll get to that six million figure. And so therefore there is the capacity for the government to extend the program to those which I believe it unintentionally left out and give them the same support. Australia prides itself on being a nation of a fair go. And it is simply not fair that so many deserving people are missing out. Mr Deputy Speaker, I now turn to childcare and again, the government's package was well intentioned and I accept that. But it was poorly thought through and my view is that again, it could be rectified and, and we could ensure that the childcare sector is supported in an even and balanced way so that there are not um, organisations or childcare centres that miss out or staff from those centres that uh, equally are forced to miss out because the package was not structured appropriately. It is not a criticism of government because I accept that everything had to be done with a degree of urgency. It is simply an observation that having brought in a package, we could make it better and I ask the government to do so. That also includes those people that are here from overseas who find themselves here and can't leave the country even if they want to. People might have been here on work visas or simply visitors visas, but they are here and many of them don't have any work rights, no income and no assistance. In fact, in many cases, their visas are about to expire. They can't leave, so they have to apply for an extension to their visa. That comes at a cost of several hundred dollars. It's an additional penalty to what they currently face. I don't believe it would be unreasonable for the government to waive the fees in this case and in this instance, under these circumstances. And so again, I ask the government to do that. But I also ask the government to look at how else it might be able to assist those people who came to this country, we allowed them in, they came here either as tourists or to help our economy as workers and now find themselves in the situation that they do. M Mr Deputy Speaker, another matter I'm going to briefly touch on which doesn't concern this nation directly is in respect to Taiwan. If there is a shining light and a shining example of how well this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been managed, it's the country of Taiwan. They've had 440 odd cases up, up until the last report I read and seven deaths. That's in a population of 24 million, almost the size of Australia. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe we could learn from what Taiwan did, and yet Taiwan are not members of the World Health Organisation. They are being barred as observers from it, and I would like to think that our government might support them in at least being observers to the next World Health Organisation meeting. The Deputy Speaker, the last issue I'm going to turn to is how COVID-19 
has exposed many of the weaknesses that we have in Australia. And in particular, the weakness that we now face as a result of having allowed our manufacturing sector to decline to the extent that it has. In the 50s and 60s, the manufacturing sector in this country accounted for about 28% of GDP and 28% of employment. Today it accounts for less than 6% of GDP and probably around 7% of employment. It is not just the jobs that we have lost, and that is important in, in itself, but it is the loss of capacity and ability to do things and make things at a time of critical need. And we saw that with COVID-19, with so many of the health products um, that we needed, which were in short supply, and, and I have to commend the number of companies who quickly tried to adjust so that they could make them. But the reality is that it is times like this that the importance of the manufacturing sector is exposed, as it was during World War II, and yet this country has allowed the manufacturing to go backwards. I believe that, the, that it would be in the national interest for us once again to look at the importance of manufacturing, the research and development it provides, the innovation it provides, the jobs it provides, the security it provides, and the benefits to the economy that it provides, and reinvest in it and try to rebuild manufacturing across Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, in, in closing, can I say this? Um, I thank people across Australia who have, in one way or another, come together to respond to COVID-19. It is something that our world, at least in my lifetime, has never experienced before. I accept that we are dealing with a matter that there is no textbook that we can look to as to how it was dealt with in the past and what we should do. And I ac accept that mistakes might be made. And they will probably be made because people will be acting in good faith. Having said that, if we realise that things are not going as planned, then let's work together and correct the, the, uh, the problems that arise as they do. Because there will be more problems arise as we particularly get the economic fallout hitting us in the months ahead, so that we can ensure that the people of this, of this country get the best support from government that they can. I thank the, I thank the member for making for that brilliant contribution and its inc incisive observations. I now uh, ask the question that the document be noted. I call the member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, much has been said this week about the government's strong economic response to the coronavirus, but today I want to talk about the swift and strong health response by our government, which has put Australia in an enviable position amongst many other countries in the world. In an unprecedented crisis, feeling unsure and uncertain would be understandable, but the consistent and sound leadership of Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Health Minister Greg Hunt, with Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy and supported by the National Cabinet, has provided Australians with a plan for us to follow and without doubt it is working. Though even one death is one death too many, to have had less than 100 deaths in a global pandemic which has claimed the lives of almost 300,000 people worldwide is something that we should be proud of. Every single person who has listened to the rules and stayed home and practised good hygiene and appropriate social distancing has made a difference. We can look at the statistics and realise that our actions matter and they do make a difference. In Tasmania, we have just entered our sixth day of no new COVID-19 cases, a cause for cautious optimism. Though I must stress, we are all acutely aware that we are not out of the woods yet. In total, our state has seen 225 cases of COVID-19, with 187 recovered and 13 deaths. In my community of Northern Tasmania, which I represent, we have had just 23 of the total 225 cases. Many of these cases are connected with cruise ships and in particular the Ruby Princess. But I'd like to take the time to commend Tasmania's Premier Peter Gutwin for his prompt, sound and decisive decision making, which has led to our island state being in a much, much better position than we otherwise may have found ourselves in. The Premier was just a number of weeks into his new role when the pandemic hit, and I'm sure I speak for all Tasmanians when I say he has done an amazing job in leading our state. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the relentless work undertaken by healthcare professionals in our community 
and highlight some of the tremendous work that they've done. To the staff at the Launceston General Hospital, particularly those in the COVID ward who took on the care of coronavirus cases after an outbreak in the northwest, I say thank you. It was particularly disheartening to see negative comments on social media last week after a worker on the ward tested positive to COVID-19. These professionals are doing their jobs and putting their lives at risk every day for our community, and they deserve nothing less than our thanks and our praise. To the midwives on the maternity ward at the Launceston General Hospital, who have worked tirelessly to support new mothers in our community, but also expecting parents from the northwest, who had to shift north after the northwest hospitals were closed due to coronavirus outbreak. There was somewhat of a baby boom with 91 babies born in the unit over two weeks in April, which was far more than the average of 30 the ward usually sees at this time of the year. Thank you for taking such good care of all the mums and dads at a time of so much uncertainty. To Dr Jerome Muir Wilson and the crew at the Launceston Health Hub, who have worked so efficiently and quickly with us to get a much needed respiratory clinic off the ground, thank you. The clinic, part of the government's $2.4 billion health package in response to COVID-19, uh, with ass ass assessment, testing and treatment, is playing a vital role in supporting our community during the pandemic. Importantly, it is also reducing pressure on the Launceston General Hospital's emergency department and allows for other local medical practices <coughs> to treat people who aren't showing signs of the coronavirus. In a community with high representation of the elderly, vulnerable and those with chronic disease, there was always a concern that beyond being susceptible to COVID-19, the general health of many in northern Tasmania may suffer as people stayed away from seeing their general practitioner or specialist. I have been urging anyone in our community with existing chronic health conditions not to neglect their regular health. This is an area where telehealth services in particular have become critical and our government's package put together in a matter of days at a cost of more than $600 million has undoubtedly saved lives. Our community can also now have their PBS medicines delivered to their home from a community pharmacy of their choice through the COVID-19 home medicine service. Of course, we have seen more than just concern over the physical impact that the coronavirus can have on the community. The mental health impact has been devastating for many and will have long running repercussions. For those who have lost jobs, who are feeling incredibly lonely due to isolation and social distancing measures, and for those who are feeling heightened anxiety about their pandemic, it has been a terribly difficult time. Mental health consultations have formed part of the telehealth response, and our government has also funded an additional $74 million in mental health services, assisting to support additional services for Lifeline, Kids Helpline, and creating a dedicated coronavirus helpline with Beyond Blue. With calls to Lifeline jumping more than 20%, and Beyond Blue seeing a 30% increase in calls and emails. This investment has literally been life-saving for many. In my own community, I've undertaken a variety of measures to communicate the importance of looking after our mental health, and I'd particularly like to thank Caroline Thane, clinical leader at Headspace Launceston, for taking the time to film some important videos with me on how we can look after ourselves and our family during this time. Though not on the front line of health, it would also be remiss of me not to acknowledge the educators in our community. Certainly, when the school year returned in the warm summer sun of early February, we could not have foreseen the major disruption that would occur before Term 1 had really got underway and students found their footing in their new classes. You have been asked to do so much and so quickly, while still being so supportive of the students that you care for. It has not gone unnoticed and we thank you. Finally, a special thank you to the whole Northern Tasmanian community. It has been a very long and difficult few months so far, and there is still more work ahead of us. Thank you all for doing the right thing to protect everyone in our community. By staying home, you have saved lives. Keep going, remain vigilant. We are all in this together. I thank the member for that contribution. I now
uh, ask the question that the document be noted, and I call um, the member for Lingiari. Or Thank you, Pat. That's him. Ling yep, you got him. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could call me a lot of things, but I'm pleased you've called me. The, I have been. I'm pleased you've called me the member for Lingiari in this instance. Thank you. Uh, I, it's my great pleasure to be able to make a contribution <coughs> to this discussion. And at the outset, I want to endorse uh, very strongly the remarks which were made in the main chamber uh, in response to the statement from the Minister for Health, uh, the Honourable Greg Hunt, uh, member for Flinders, uh, by the Shadow Minister for Health, the member for McMahon, <coughs> and say, uh, I don't want to uh, repeat the comments he made, other than to acknowledge and thank again the work from the Minister, for, uh, Minister Greg Hunt who first consulted with me over the impact of COVID-19 at the opening of the, def the detention facility on Christmas Island. Uh, he was very forthright in, in those discussions uh, and I was very pleased that he was able to have them with me. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, the numerous discussions I've had with Commonwealth officials, including uh, over the months now, uh, Professor Brendan Murphy and the input he's provided uh, to all of us. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lucas de Tocca, as someone whom I've known for some years, who worked prior to coming to Canberra, worked in Miwatch Aboriginal Health Service in North East Arnhem Land, <coughs> and he's provided invaluable insights and received our comments most, most uh, readily uh, when they're being made by myself and others, including uh, the member for uh, the, um, the Shadow Minister, Linda Byrne, and the member for Barton. Uh, Senator Pat Dodson and Senator Mullandiri McCarthy, uh, and I do want to thank them, uh, for thank them and all of the people they work with, for the outstanding work they've been doing. As I do thank all those involved in uh, working with the Australian community to keep us safe, whether they're health workers in the hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, the cleaners, the administrators, or those people stacking shelves in Woolworths, or the transport drivers providing logistical support. All of those people need to be. Uh, given our acknowledgement and thanks. <clears throat> uh, but I want to, um, uh, and I want to most particularly acknowledge as well, uh, the leadership shown in the Northern Territory by the Chief Minister Michael Gunner, his uh, Minister Natasha Files and the Chief Medical Officer Hugh Heggie, uh, and thank them for, the, for their discussions with us. Uh, but I do want to um, raise, though, in particular, um, the forbearance of the community in dealing with the isolation that they've been forced to suffer. Uh, and that's been really very important. And the closure of the borders by the Northern Territory Government has meant that we've effectively had no uh, community cases of COVID-19 in the Northern Territory. Uh, and so we're free of, effectively free of COVID at the moment, and we want to keep it that way. Uh, and the Northern Territory Government's now got a road, a road map to our new normal, which I'm happy to show the Deputy, Deputy um, Speaker. That's important. Uh, but, uh, and that will lead eventually on the 18th of June, uh, if not sooner, with the uh, lifting the biosecurity boundaries which are affecting the ability of Aboriginal people to travel into main centres. But it's been a very important, a very, very important initiative which they've undertaken to control the spread of the virus if it were to come into the Northern Territory. But the issue I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, is, the, is the question of contingency planning. Should there be a case or cases arise in remote parts of this country uh, and impact on the most vulnerable people in the Australian community, Aboriginal people in remote communities? Uh, and I want to particularly uh, make an observation about a plan, a document which has been released by um, AMSANT and the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress in the Northern Territory entitled A COVID-19 Contain and Test Strategy for Remote Aboriginal Communities. For some weeks now I've been most concerned about what these contingency plans might look like should there be an outbreak of COVID-19 in a, an Aboriginal community. Uh, and a contain and test strategy, which this is, uh, is, is about a first response. It's Come, flows out of the experience of the community of Vaux in Northern Italy uh, and is around dealing with a specific communicable disease emergency. Uh, it's strictly it's for a strictly defined location 
uh, it's for a strictly defined period, uh, and in this case it would only be in areas which have got the support and acknowledgement of the Aboriginal organisations, Aboriginal communities in Northern Australia. Uh, I do note that this strategy has a strong support of acknowledged public health experts uh, such as uh, in the Northern Territory, Dr John Boffer uh, and Dr Paul Tazillo uh, from Nunapa Health in uh, South Australia. I just want to tell you what a contain and contest strategy is. And this is important, getting your heads around what this means in a remote community, in an isolated remote community. It means confining all community members to their households until two rounds of testing is completed, up to 14 days. That's a significant requirement. Multiple rounds of testing for COVID-19, except children under five, uh, offering a relocation of particularly vulnerable elderly or sick people to safe quarantine accommodation outside the community, restricting all movement in and out of the community, everyone in the community wearing masks, relocating people identified with COVID-19 out of the households to safe accommodation outside the community, including those with significant vulnerabilities to be relocated as close as possible to hospital-based care, and that in itself may present an issue in remote parts of this country, because the availability of hospital beds for this particular purpose will be limited. And I think of my own community in Alice Springs where the hospital has done extraordinarily good work. But the importance about this is an evidence-based approach. And it's, got, it's built on what's happened elsewhere. Uh, and in this case, it's being called for by Aboriginal organisations across the north, north of Australia. And it's very different. There's a problem with, it, with, with how we think about this stuff, is there's a hangover of the intervention of 2007 by John Howard and Mal Bruff into the Northern Territory, where people were compelled to do things and having the army present, etc. Well, this is not like that. This is about engaging with the Aboriginal community through their organisations, them coming up with a, a plan uh, in this instance, um, and we call it a contain and test strategy, and then coming up with this plan and having it implemented and supported by government. Now, it means selling a hard message to those communities, because what we're effectively doing is locking them down. So if there is an instance of uh, an occurrence of um, in a remote community, you take out those people who have been impacted um, uh, initially. Um, then you test all the households effectively, you isolate people and you isolate the community. Now this creates all sorts of issues around logistical support, around what the sort of uh, public health requirements might be, the health hardware that's required. And I note there's a proposal which has had some, which has been out, been uh, a, a proposal which I only saw yesterday for the Commonwealth State and Territory Housing Infrastructure Response to COVID-19, um, put out by a number of people, including Health Habitat, the Nunapa Health Council, Housing for Health Incubator and the Fulcrum Agency, which has some merit in what it's talking about is how you provide the health hardware to deal with instances like this. So whilst we've got to talk about the broader issues, and we should, around food security, access to logistics and isolation, what we've got to understand is that there are a whole range of other measures which need to be thought of when we're looking about when we're talking about contingency plans for an outbreak of COVID-19 in a remote part of this country. Uh, and this approach, which has been um, advanced by AMSANT with the support of Aboriginal health organisations in the Northern Territory around um, a contain and test strategy is something I applaud and something I would seek support of. Uh, from the government. I know it's something which is being discussed right now, uh, but as I say, I've been raising questions about contingency planning for some weeks, uh, and I'm most concerned to make sure that we have input into those processes, understanding the expert health advice which we've got to receive and act upon, and that's what I'd be saying we would be doing in this case. And so I'd commend the approach which, which they are proposing. That's not to say it's without, not without difficulties because it would be. Uh, but I am sure that if this nation wants to grapple with what could be into the future, bearing in mind the Northern Territory, in the Northern Territory's case and in South Australia, their boundaries are closed. The possibility of importing a communicable case of COVID is very limited at the moment. 
but that's not to say it's not there. And if it were to appear in a remote place, it would require all sorts of we would provide all sorts of difficulty for us all. So I commend the approach which is being proposed uh, by AMSANT with the support of the Aboriginal health organisations, particularly Congress from, from Alice Springs. Thank you. Time has expired. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I move that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next meeting. Uh, seconder. Second the motion, I'd just like to put in the hands of the appreciation of your ISO haircut. Uh, uh, I did. He got a photo of it. Yeah, all those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Second. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Gilmore. Oh, sorry. The member for uh, Stirling. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Coronavirus has presented Australia with less of an opportunity and more of an imperative to fundamentally change for the better. One significant change required is the development of a national resilience strategy. This strategy will identify ways in which we can diversify and de-risk across critical supply chains and so ensure that Australia remains fit to meet the changed world ahead. The difficulty we have faced recently in securing additional surgical masks from overseas is emblematic of wider requirement to better identify and mitigate supply chain risks. Australian ingenuity and resolve saw the domestic production cap capabilities of Australia for surgical masks increase from 2 million masks per year to around 200 million masks per year. And the challenge now is to identify where else we need to fix unhealthy levels of dependence. The Institute for Economic Research reports that 90% of Australia's medicines are imported, and around one third of Australians rely on daily prescribed medicines. Australia has almost no capacity to manufacture any active pharmaceutical product for essential medicines. A supply chain disruption of life-saving medicines is also not just some far-off distant possibility. In fact, last year here in Australia, there was a shortage of the life-saving EpiPen Juniors used to treat anaphylactic reactions in children. Manufacturing and quality failures in the supply chain caused Australian supplies to run out in December 2019. As an island nation, separated from much of the world by vast ocean distances, Australia must also continue enhancing our liquid fuel security. At the end of February, Australia had 81 days' worth of oil supplies, which included 25 days of stocks in overseas ports and in transit to Australia. We're in the process of closing the gap on our 90-day stockpiling commitment under the International Energy Agency. And our Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Angus Taylor, has committed $94 million to buy oil at the currently low global prices and for this to be stored in the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve. This is Australia's first government-owned oil reserve for domestic fuel security. And Minister Taylor has also flagged our next move to establish significant onshore liquid fuel storage. It's also essential that we retain a capacity to refine fuel here in Australia. Recent years have seen an over-reliance on overseas students in the university education sector. The high fees paid by foreign students have now been greatly disrupted, and here again we must diversify and de-risk if we are to avoid massive disruptions into the future. The process of creating a national resilience strategy would involve an assessment to identify, alongside essential medicines, liquid fuels and tertiary education, where else Australia is exposed to an unbalanced supply chain risk. To achieve national resilience, we will also need a far more efficient workforce in the post-COVID environment. So we must consider labour and energy costs, which are central ingredients for viable domestic manufacturing. Another example where Australia is already on the right track is the establishment last year of the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office 
and this is under the initiative of the Critical Mineral Strategy, similar to that which has also been developed in the United States. Now this is a very welcome step and Australia must now provide our developing critical minerals miners with tangible support if we expect to see any shift in global market dominance in critical minerals. We need to put our shoulder to the wheel in support of great Australian critical minerals miners like Northern Minerals in my home state of Western Australia. Even a few weeks ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, calls for a national resilience strategy would scarcely have resonated. The blow which has been delivered by COVID-19 has changed everything. We must now meet this changed world as it is in all its complexity and with all its challenges with the confidence to make our own changes and to secure Australia's future. I call the member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise today to talk about a small rural community in my electorate that you may not have heard of. The village of Sassafras is the westerly most point of the Shoalhaven local government area, right up against the border of my electorate. The closest township is Neriga, where the local pub is a popular stopover between Nowra and Braidwood. Sassafras also happens to be one of the areas of my electorate that was hardest hit by the bushfires. In early March, I attended the Sassafras Community Recovery Meeting hosted by Shoalhaven Council at the Neriga pub. It's a shame that the minister wasn't there to hear what the people of Sassafras had to say. So I thought I would share their experience. To say the people of Sassafras are angry is an understatement. They feel totally and completely abandoned by this government, forgotten by my Liberal predecessors as well as by their Liberal state members. And to be honest, Deputy Speaker, who can blame them? The day after the meeting, I went back to meet with some of the residents I had spoken with the night before, like farmer Greg. Greg's story was tough to hear, but tougher to experience. He and his wife stayed to defend their property and farm. Greg described the fire as it came roaring towards his property like an explosion. It destroyed everything in its path. Greg's wife had trouble returning to the property. Greg's paddock to plate farm has suffered through the drought for three years, the same drought the government said we were not in. Following advice from the Department of Primary Industries, Greg reduced his stock numbers, something that many farmers have heartbreakingly been forced to do. Greg's wife had to return to work to help pay the bills. Their on-farm income decreased and they were forced to find new ways of getting by. To help add to their supplemental income, they started an orchard. The season just gone, they had finally matured. They were anticipating sales of produce such as fruit, berries and olives. They were excited and feeling like perhaps they might finally get back on their feet. But these hopes were dashed when bushfire raged through their property. The orchard was destroyed. They also lost farm infrastructure, machinery and stock feed. So they decided to apply for the government's $75,000 disaster assistance grant for primary producers. But they were rejected because their on-farm income wasn't enough. Because Greg's wife's income was deemed too high because the government could not understand the impact the drought had on them. Greg was devastated. I want to read a little bit of what Greg told me so you can hear it in his own words, and I quote, "'We are left feeling very let down, despite the government's talk of support for those that need it. After the drought, the direct impact of the fires, the period of isolation and continuing to live with the devastation that has been wrought, and now the new restrictions and force due to the coronavirus, the hope that we had been given has been taken for us." End quote. Heartbreaking, but I am still fighting for Greg. That same day, I also met with Alison and Richard from Sassafras Nuts, a completely off-grid commercial chestnut and walnut farm. Visitors can come to the farm to pick nuts and have lunch surrounded by the beautiful trees, but sadly their farm was badly hit by the fires. They lost 30-year-old walnut trees, two nursery areas and 200 young chestnuts. They showed me how they were working to repair and protect their damaged trees, the burns unit, they call it. 
Most of their income is made during one month of the year. During the harvest, they hire labourers to help, but without sales, they can't invest in those jobs. They rely on the tourists, but with fires and now COVID-19, the tourists have diminished. Their trees will take four to five years before they produce again. Alison and Richard are upbeat, they are resilient, and they are fighters. But aside from the $75,000 primary producer grant, which barely touched the sides on what needed to be done at the farm, they were receiving no help. Deputy Speaker, from so many people I spoke to in Sassafras, I heard the same thing. They are sick and tired of being forgotten. They need help. Well, to everyone in Sassafras, I say to you, I will not forget you. I will keep standing with you and standing up for you. I just hope the government will start listening. I'll call the member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the recent Queensland local government election saw sweeping changes uh, to those who lead uh, their local communities across my electorate for the next four years. The local government elections saw eight new mayors elected in our various Indigenous communities located across the electorate, and they include the Woodgill Woodgill Mayor Bradley Creek, Hopevale Mayor Jason Wybo, Cowan Yama Mayor Robert Sands, uh, Pomparau Mayor Richard Tup Pup Tupacha, uh, Aracoon uh, Mayor Kerry Tamoy, Napraman Mayor Janita Mutton, Northern Peninsula Area Mayor Patricia Yusa, and Torres Strait Island Regional Council Mayor uh, Philemon Mosby. There are only two mayors actually uh, in, in the uh, Indigenous communities across my electorate that were actually uh, re elected. One was the Lockhart River where, uh, Mayor Wayne Butcher and the Marpoon uh, Shire Mayor uh, Eileen Addo. Uh, Torres Strait uh, Shire Council Mayor uh, Vonda Moore and the Weeper Town Authority Chair Michael Rowlands, along with the Cook Shire Mayor Peter Scott, were all re elected. And, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of those outgoing mayors and councillors across the various Indigenous communities for their service over the past four years. I'd also like to welcome and acknowledge all of the new incoming councillors across the Indigenous communities uh, to their new roles. We're all facing unprecedented challenges uh, that the uh, coronavirus pandemic has presented, and there's absolutely no doubt that their leadership uh, in uh, moving forward is going to be particularly more important than ever. Deputy Speaker, a little closer to home, the Mariba Shire Council elected a new leader in Mayor uh, Angeline Toppen, uh, following the retirement of uh, long-serving Mayor and former Queensland uh, Minister Tommy Gilmore. Uh, Douglas Shire Council elected their new lead leader in, in Michael Kerr, who defeated the incumbent Julia Liu in a hard fought race. And it's great to see, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that Michael has really hit the ground running and is making some great decisions there. And uh, it's great to see uh, there's certainly a uh, I, I guess a, a whole new spark in what's happening in the Douglas Shire and I certainly look forward to working uh, very closely with him uh, into the future. Cassowary Coast Regional Council and Tablelands Regional Councils also saw, saw new leaders elected in uh, Mark Nolan and uh, Mayor Rod Marty. Roddy, Rod uh, replacing the, the, the previous Mayor of the Tablelands uh, Council, Joe Paranella, who had uh, decided that he also, like Tom Gilmore from Mariba, had decided that he was, it was time to retire. Cairns Regional Council Mayor Bob Manning was re-elected uh, for the third time, uh, but there were a few new faces across the various council divisions, uh, including a uh, uh, Amy Eden, Christy Valley, uh, Rob, uh, Rob Pine and Rhonda Coglin. Um, who uh, were certainly looking forward with their, their new enthusiasm and I'd like to uh, take the opportunity of congratulating Mayor uh, Manning uh, on his re-election and uh, extend my congratulations to the four new division councillors for their success. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, the uh, unsuccessful councillor uh, Schilling, Rob Schilling, who uh, had done a great job, but uh, unfortunately in this job you never know uh, how you go uh, and how, uh, and 
particularly with the difficult election that we had with the, the, the COVID election, if you like, made it very, very difficult to campaign. But uh, I think he should be recognised for the work that he did and, and thank him also for, the, for uh, his, his uh, contribution. Mr Deputy Speaker, local government will no doubt play a very critical role as we chart the road to recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Our local elected representatives, irrespective of where they're located, will be instrumental in uh, leading their respective communities along this path. And finally, I'd like to just take the opportunity to all the new mayors and councillors, wish them all the success uh, in their roles. And I look forward to meeting them personally uh, when the time is to do so is appropriate, I'm able to travel to these far-reaching areas. Thank you. I call the member for Melbourne. I've heard from hundreds of people in my electorate of Melbourne about the JobKeeper payment. And whilst we cautiously welcome the introduction of this scheme after pressuring the government for weeks to introduce a wage subsidy, JobKeeper is still leaving millions behind. Over one million casual workers remain excluded, half of whom are young people. Approximately one million temporary working visa holders are excluded. Our arts and creative sector has been left behind and we've seen the, we've seen the government do whatever it takes to ensure that schools and universities are denied the support they so crucially need. This is shameful and it's unacceptable. And for those that may be eligible, many of them struggle to keep up with the constantly changing and confusing information. Those who are relying on this payment, including small businesses across the country, have not been able to confirm their eligibility before being required to make significant financial decisions. And this is causing anxiety and exposes many workers and employees to financial risk. During this time of crisis, workers and businesses need clarity, certainty and support. And unfortunately, the government continues to cause confusion. But to hear members of the government and now the Labor Party saying that JobKeeper payment might be too high for some people and potentially ripping money away from low paid workers who have already received it is disappointing to say the least. We cannot pit workers against each other and leave them in the lurch. The government must expand the JobKeeper program but not at the cost of low paid workers. Just this morning we have heard, heard of the horrifying job figures which highlight the scale of the crisis we face. Nearly four in ten young people do not have a job or do not have enough hours of work. The government is using young people as economic cannon fodder in this crisis. And this is a warning. Unless the government massively invests to recover from this crisis, already skyrocketing unemployment and underemployment for young people will, will reach catastrophic levels in the coming months and years. Today's figures reveal an unemployment rate of 6.2% with 37.3 per cent of young people out of work or not having enough hours of work, even without taking into account any hidden impact of JobKeeper. But these concerning figures obscure the extent of the crisis that we face, because an additional 490,000 people are currently not in the labour force uh, and, and are not being counted in our unemployment figures. This government is jeopardising the future of young people, and we need to invest in nation-building projects to create decent jobs and a living income to give young people hope. I also want to take this opportunity to talk about one of the group of workers who have gone largely and publicly unrecognised during this pandemic, childcare workers. These are frontline workers and educators who, despite any trepidation they feel in these uncertain times, show up to work day in, day out with a smile on their face. These workers reassure, care for and educate our nation's youngest mind. And as the father of two daughters under the age of five, I know how much childcare means to my family, and I'm sure every parent around the country can agree that childcare workers hold a special place in their families' hearts. I talk about the trepidation that childcare workers and centres are feeling right now because I've spoken with childcare centre operators in my electorate of Melbourne, and they have told me that they are barely surviving under this government's COVID-19 childcare package. They told me that where their expenses have gone up, what with needing to buy more wipes and more sanitizer, for example, their incomes have gone down. And while parents no longer have to pay childcare fees, the government's relief package only covers about 50 per cent of uh, these centres' pre-COVID income, with centres expected to make up the remaining income with JobKeeper payments. But the JobKeeper payment is full of holes, and childcare centres are struggling because JobKeeper is falling short. One childcare centre in my electorate formally employed several educators who held temporary working visas. 
Now, they've been excluded from the government's package, but the government is also saying to the centre, oh, it's okay, rely on JobKeeper. Well, it's not available. And the centre's operators were distressed when they told me that they'd had to let these workers go because they were ineligible for JobKeeper. Another centre in my electorate is currently short-staffed. In a time when so many people are out of work, this childcare centre is unable to fill their staffing vacancies because the government has excluded their workers from receiving JobKeeper. Childcare centres have told me they're having to drastically cut staffing hours, shorten the centre's operating hours and let go of valued staff just to stay open. I know, and parents across the country all know, that childcare is an essential service. It's so essential that I believe that government should make free and universal childcare permanent. As a parent, I want to thank the childcare workers who look after kids and educate children right across the country. And as an MP, I urge the government to fix up this mess and provide childcare centres with the support they need to continue doing the essential work they do. I call the member for line. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak briefly about the COVID-19 crisis and how Australia's handled it. I'm so pleased to be back in Parliament representing the good people of Lyon who'd like to say a big thank you and a big shout out to our Prime Minister, Minister Hunt, Minister Andrews and um, all the team, including Professor Brendan Murphy and all the National Cabinet contributions, because most people realise Australia's done a great job. But we shouldn't get complacent, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this COVID-19 virus is new to all of us. We don't have any innate immunity. It is very infective. The little fomites, the bits that you leave behind on furniture or on railings or in cars or trains or buses, is very infective for hours, sometimes days. And that's why this personal infection control practices are so important. Like if you do have a cough or a sniffle, get tested. But if you're gonna cough in public, run into a corner, do it. Cough into your elbow, wash your hands. All these personal things that you can control will help prevent spread fomites, which then can rub on or touch somebody else's hand. Um, the main thing we've got to realise is this is just the first round. It's like the first quarter of an AFL uh, game. We have contained it and we are in control at the, at the first break. But there are many more runs of this virus around the world. The nature of a new virus is that it will continue to spread around the world till it um, has 60% people immune and then it will naturally fade because you lose half the people it can jump to. That's the thing with viruses. They can't reproduce themselves. They need to be inside another cell. That's why what they need next is the next person who's not immune to jump and then they will survive and grow and replicate and then jump to the next person. So all this isolation containment is to stop the spread and until we become immune or we get an effective treatment um, or we get a vaccine, which would be even better, uh, this will continue to spread. So we're at first quarter break, uh, we've got many more to go. And we shouldn't think that it wasn't as bad as people said. You've just got to look at where, what's happened around the world. Now, what we have done is we've done some amazing things. And again, I'd like to give great shout outs to the whole health team, um, increasing our capacity, both in personal protective equipment uh, Minister Andrews has done a great job sourcing it from around the world and there was competition and there still is competition. Increasing our ventilator capacity, increasing our ICU capacity, setting up 436 respiratory clinics in case there is bigger waves, developing our own app. And I was so proud this morning to stand with some of my other medical colleagues and uh, we put out a press release and had a conference supporting the app. It was multi-partisan support. It is a unique Australian developed app. 5.6 million people have downloaded it so far and can I encourage anyone who's listening to get more uh, downloads because it is a numbers game. The more people that have it, uh, it does exactly what the government says and no one else can use it except the health authorities. Uh, the tech heads have looked at it surreptitiously. The Australian Centre for Cyber Security has looked at it. It does exactly what it does. It just records uh, phone contact or close contact for more than 15 minutes if you've got your app enabled on Bluetooth. There are some furfies out there. We've designed it specifically for Australia. It's different from the Apple thing. It is on, if, as long as you've installed it and enabled it, it will go. 
it's better than the what Apple designed, it's better than what anyone else has designed, and it will help use 2020 technology to turbocharge tracing of any contacts. And it's voluntary, you control it, you enable it, and if they ring you and say your phone's been in contact with someone we've just diagnosed and your number came up, uh, can we get your contacts? It's still up to you, because all the data stays on your phone. It only goes up into the servers later on when you press send. But if your phone has been next to another phone for more than 15 minutes within one and a half metres, this little digital handshake will happen. So it's really important. Uh, again, great Australian ingenuity that has done it. Now, I mentioned also about a cure or a vaccine. Australia is at the forefront of this. We have got many universities involved, but I suspect the treatment might happen quicker than vaccine and it will be combination therapy like it has been for vi other viruses like hepatitis C, HIV and also other similar things like TB. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcomed in the start of 2020 with my family in Queensland. I wasn't in Hawaii and I knew at the time that 2020 was going to be a challenging year. I knew that because Australia was burning. And this existential crisis entailed more than finding clean air to breathe. Many Australians saw voracious bushfires greedily engulfing our wide brown land, threatening homes and lives. On New Year's Day, 15 bushfire evacuation centres were opened to cater to those who had to escape the fires. By the 6th of January, public buildings and offices in Canberra were closed after this area recorded air quality that would close down a coal mine. On the 7th of January, amidst the bushfire crisis, another threat was taking hold. Chinese authorities confirmed that they'd identified a novel virus now known as COVID-19. Australians can be forgiven for not taking notice as we were otherwise occupied. The bushfires were still raging. Three American firefighters died on the 23rd of January when their Hercules crashed while they battled bushfires in southern New South Wales. Two days later, on the 25th of January, the first case of coronavirus was confirmed in Australia. By the 31st of January, there were nine cases confirmed in Australia. And so this horrible crisis snuck up on Australians, not while we were sleeping, but while we were already trying to contain a bushfire disaster that has left 3,500 Australians homeless and claimed 34 lives. How, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, our lives have been turned upside down. In a country that prides itself on its freedoms, we were ordered to not travel, to stay home, to not visit our parents or our grandparents, not to hug, not to shake hands. And there has been heartache. Businesses ceased operating, jobs were lost, people have found themselves in circumstances they never thought possible. My Morton people are doing it tough, but when my community faces a crisis, we come together and we help those who need it most. I saw this during the 2011 floods that devastated a third of my electorate, and I've seen it recently. So when people began to isolate, the community groups in Morton worked together. They adapted their practices they, so they could help those who had lost their income, those with illnesses, uh, those who were vulnerable and the elderly. My office took hundreds of calls and emails seeking help. Uh, people. Uh, such as filling in medical strips, providing boxes of food, making home-cooked meals for affordable prices, providing fuel or go-cards, and even helping to, put, to cover utility bills. Sometimes people simply scheduled in a weekly chat with somebody who was feeling alone and scared. These wonderful and dedicated uh, helpers are from groups such as St David's Neighbourhood Centre, Kyabra Community Association, Belong, Sherwood Neighbourhood Centre, Community Plus, Village Avenue Community Church, Meals on Wheels at Acacia Ridge, Meals on Wheels at Sunnybank, Salisbury and Yoronga and Sherwood, the Kirby Mosque, the Cathay Community Association, the Sherwood Services Club, the ADRA Community Centre and so many more. I often find myself in awe of the staff and volunteers who work these organisations. They turn up every day, although the work is tough, yet they make a huge difference in people's lives. We are likely to be living with the consequences of this health crisis for a very long time. We know that the economic fallout will be immense. We're not just going to snap back, as Prime Minister Morrison has blithely suggested. The people of Morton will need more than marketing slogans to cope with the economic hardship. Uh, we'll need real leadership. There will be hard decisions to make, and these decisions should be guided by a commitment to jobs and skills for those who need them and retraining, a fair income safety net that supports people, uh, and an infrastructure program that helps to rebuild the nation. 
Our challenge must be to recover stronger and better. Don't waste a crisis. It's a chance that we don't have very often, thankfully, but don't waste it. We want a more resilient society. We want people to have secure work. We don't want job seekers stuck in poverty and we don't want scientists ignored, for example, if they warn us about dangerous climate change. I want my community to rebuild better than it was before and Morton was pretty awesome before COVID-19 hit. We have some way to go before we're out of this health crisis. We have to stay vigilant. So, Deputy Speaker, I know that there are hard days to come. I know that the people and community groups in Morton are kind and perhaps sometimes that compassion won't be endless. Uh, that, but I've seen people that are generous and dedicated to helping others. We'll get through this together because we're a supportive and cohesive community. I know that uh, kindness will prevail and that we will come through this together and we'll be stronger and better. And we will counter the voices of those that are trying to divide and exploit this crisis to create division. Uh, instead, I know that we will be kinder and stronger together. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Federation Chamber stands adjourned until 4pm Tuesday, the 11th of August 2020.